Hi, my name is Noah Gift, and I'm the author of this O'Reilly book, Practical ML Ops. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this next uh, training here that's a, a several hours long. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cover the, the basics of how to go from zero, uh, learn about the, the trends that are happening with ML Ops, and then use pre-trained models in a GitHub code space to actually build out summarization, uh, natural language processing tools, and a lot of other tools that are available by using Hugging Face and OpenAI. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, happy to be here today. A uh, lot of new stuff I'm, I'm gonna cover today that I think will be helpful to everybody. And uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the research I'm doing as well for a new book uh, beyond uh, practical MLOps called Enterprise MLOps. And I'm talking with a lot of the leading experts on MLOps. Uh, and that material is going to go into the book. So I'm going to cover all the stuff that's really cutting edge today as well as some traditional material. So I can probably get right into it then. Uh, I have a lot of stuff to cover. So first up, what I will do is uh, screen share. And let's start with the view of the world of MLOps trends and techniques. I think this is a great way to uh, think about uh, how things are are headed and uh, first i'll just really briefly mention uh a, a little bit about my background because it's i think relevant to to ml ops and and potentially maybe to other people that are watching this so the the start of my career really was working in 3d animated film back in the uh los angeles area so you know hollywood la glendale burbank that whole area uh, was pretty interesting in the late 90s and also early 2000s because you would do Python programming on site inside of a mounted file system that was an NFS based file system and so it was it was a, it was very interesting how how that workflow has now trended towards what we now do with data engineering so you know 20 years ago 25 years ago the film industry Disney Sony uh, Pixar have really been doing a lot of these these same things since then, I've, I've done a, some other things in my career, but I've written um, four plus books for Riley. I'm on the fifth one right now, written nine plus books. Uh, I built a social media company with uh, millions of users and millions in revenue from zero. And I used MLOps heavily uh, when, when, we, when we did this. This was 2013. So I have some experience with recommendation engines and also some of the ethical problems with social media. And then recently I've been consulting uh, and I've uh, wrote the book Practical MLOps and I'm now on a new book uh, for O'Reilly called Impl Implementing MLOps in Enterprise. So that's a little bit of the context about what I'm going to cover today. And then I'll also just show you this visual because I like data science. And, and this is this is a uh, visual of, you know, how I kind of thought about my career. And, and I think this is kind of a fun thing to, to do if you haven't had a chance to, 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 to make one of these things where you, you put things in a um, perspective where it's, it's, it's uh, combining things instead of this linear view, it, there's like a, a nonlinear aspect to looking at everything at the same time. And so, you know, from a high level here, it, early when I was a teenager, because I grew up in the, in the LA area, I was working in the news industry. Uh, and then at the same time, I, I took a, a brief stint and worked at Caltech for a little bit on Unix file systems. And then that all those experiences helped me work in the film industry. But what's interesting about that is all that background is, has been perfect for me now that cloud computing, machine learning, and data engineering are such a big deal. So then later down the road. So sometimes when you're thinking about shifting into a different career or moving into different things, I personally think it's it's a neat idea to to kind of put together all the different skills you have into maybe a linear diagram like this. And what you may realize is that some of your previous experience, even if it was 10 years ago, could really actually be suitable to the new phase of technology because things are constantly changing. Uh, and and I think this does actually give me a, a, a pretty good perspective on, on what's happening. So that's my background. So let's talk about why MLOps here next. So in general, I think one of the big problems that's happening in the world is that we talk about data science quite a bit, but there's really not enough ROI. And, and ultimately, 
things do come down to ROI in the real, the real world. And uh, you need to prove that what you're doing is going to is going to have a return on investment for the stakeholders in your company, the external stakeholders, all of those people need to have experience with some kind of ROI. And I think we're not we're not there yet, but things are changing. Uh, also, uh, life is short, so we need to make sure that we're seeing results, not just experiments. So I, I think it's easy to get caught up in this like practice mode where all you're doing is practicing for the event in the future when really you're ready already to produce some kind of result. So I think uh, having a sense of urgency, like a bias for action is, is really important. And then third issue is that, and I've talked to many people recently about this that are experts, you know, the, the chief evangelist of uh, Hugging Face, actually, I just was talking to him. He was telling me that uh, there is a need for people to just move faster, have a sense of urgency, use higher level tools. And I can't agree with him more. Um, his name is Julian Simon. And I think these are the, the, the key items that are driving MLOps. Now, a, a couple things also that I'll mention here that I think is maybe a little bit shocking to, to people is that there is, in fact, a change afoot in terms of what's happening in industry. And Wall Street Journal, this is 2020, 2020 which is almost ancient now <laughs> because we're, we're almost in 2023. Uh, they reported that there was uh, almost a million jobs uh, a double from the year before. N right now, we can just see, you know, AWS is everywhere. Azure is everywhere. You know, the cloud computing uh, is, is just really taking a hold. And so now I think what we're seeing is that the data science job title itself is still relevant, but I think it's less relevant in, in terms of data engineering, machine learning engineering, ML ops, or cloud computing, it's more that you have to do data science as a behavior or some kind of a, of a, uh, a task inside of a broader role. Uh, so it's not like data science went away, but it may not actually be a specific specialized skill because it's so hard to pin down what a data science uh, data scientist even does. And I, and I speak from experience here because I've hired multiple teams of data scientists when I was in the Bay Area at startups, and I've taught data science at some of the top universities in the world. Nobody knows what a data scientist is. <laughs> we, we know how to teach data science. In fact, later today at Duke, I'm going to teach data science. But uh, is it actually a job title? I would probably say no for, for very specialized roles. If you're like, you know, a chief executive or something like that, or at a, at a really like a high level position in a company. Sure, you could say you're a, a chief data scientist, but I, I don't see it as a specialized role as much anymore as as I do these other job titles really taking away a lot of the, the traction for it. So, so what this means is that it isn't that we're not going to do data science anymore. It's that you probably also need to know data engineering, machine learning engineering, and cloud computing. So let's go now to some of the specifics. This is something that I'm a huge fan of is this rule of 25. So 25%. I know there's some people that are talking about data centric or model centric and you know, there's, there's a lot of validity to this, but I would say a, a key role here is that are you actually really looking at the, the real problem that's happening uh, in production? And if, if you don't have 25% of your time dedicated to, to DevOps, then you're not going to be able to address MLOps. If you don't have 25% of your time with data, so that's what people call data centric, you're going to have a problem. 25% of your time, you know, dealing with models, and then 25% of your time, you know, dealing with the business perspective. And, and this is really important, the business perspective, and not talked about enough, which is this is really the framing of the problem. Like, are you framing the problem in a way that people can actually use the results of what you built? Right, and I, I don't think any one of these is more important than the other. And in fact, I would say, in some sense, you should be worried if someone says there's this one perfect solution that will solve a problem. I just don't believe it. I think you need to have a balance. Uh, and, and that's why I think the rule of 25 is uh, a pretty good rule, right? 25% of time on each of these four uh, items. Now let's talk about strategy uh, in an organization. Uh, a lot of 
companies ask me about this. Hey, what's your MLOps strategy? You know, how would you how would you get started if you if you want to go from zero? So to start with, I think it's important to pick uh, technology partners and to know that there's no silver bullet for platforms uh, and technology providers. So a lot of times it's easy to to think that there's a silver bullet and there's one provider that will solve all of your problems, but generally there's not a silver bullet solution that will solve all of your problems. You need to have a, an approach where you use a combination of tools to, to solve your problems. And then the other thing to consider is that you, you're gonna have multiple investments in an organization. So you have maybe a primary investment uh, that, that, that I would recommend would be things like, you know, it has low cost structure. So AWS, for example, is a pretty good primary investment. You know, they have a very inexpensive compute. Lots of people use it. It's easy to hire people. They have a huge list of services uh, that you can use and it's easy to build things on top of it, right? So that would be the, the primary structure. But also you're gonna need some kind of a secondary structure. So it could be uh, a, a particular solution solves uh, a problem very well. So it could be, you know, uh, something like a Guazio, which has an MLOps framework, Databricks, which has a Spark-based MLOps uh, framework, Splunk, uh, Snowflake, really depends on who it is you have in your organization, what kind of problems you have. Are you Kubernetes-based? Are you Spark-based? What, what are some of the experiences that people in your organization have? And then in terms of investments, uh, is there an R&D focus uh, as well? Like maybe a third kind of investment is, do you think there's there's some trend that's happening? Like Hugging Face would be a good example where it looks like the pre-trained model area is gonna explode. So you need to have a little bit of, of focus there and, and look at things like deep learning tech, you know, Kubernetes, edge-based computing, all, all those kinds of things. So I, I think this is a very good formula as well, which again, going back to, picking technology partners, if you just pick one, you're going to miss out on uh, really a comprehensive strategy. The better strategy is to have primary, secondary, and then investments. And once you think that way, it's it, I think it's good uh, strategy to, to, to really be prepared for what the future brings, because it, it is difficult to know exactly what's going to happen in a particular technology space, especially something like MLOps. So now let's go back to the primary real quick and let's talk about some of the, the key drivers here. So one of them is that uh, Amazon does lead the, the market here with, uh, you know, 200 billion. It's, it's gone up uh, since then. Uh, this is a slightly old graph and you can see Azure's number two and Google Cloud's number three. So basically these are the three providers probably that you, you should care about the most in the U.S with a weighting towards the biggest ones. And why would you care about this? Well, enterprise support is huge, right? You want to be able to call uh, up support and say, hey, you know, my compute cluster is not working. What do I do? And they can and they can actually help you out in a real world scenario. Likewise, in terms of uh, industry standard certifications, I think this is a great way to get qualified people into your organization, you know, get them trained, get them working on uh, the right material, uh, and there's a there's a standard set of curriculum, and so this then makes it easy to hire, and also it's easy to upskill people because whatever market is huge, there's going to be a lot of training uh, available for it. So really, this is the Matthew effect, uh, which is that uh, the rich get rich richer, right? So once you have the the traction, it, it makes it a lot easier to to get more and more services with it. Now in terms of the secondary. Uh, considerations. One of the things to think about is that, you know, does a platform make my job easier for a specific uh, aspect of a job? So ETL kind of platform, you know, maybe something like Snowflake, log search platform, you know, can I go through and uh, use really sophisticated tools to find anomalies, you know, or cyber attacks, you know, maybe something like Splunk, monitoring, you know, Datadog or New Relic, do I have, does it have, you know, kind of a easy plug and play uh, application performance monitoring tools? You know, these are, these are all important things to consider. Like, are they going to add to the velocity of what it is that you're doing? And then if we go into the popular certifications here, 
uh, again, easy to hire, easy to train, even for the secondary, right? So a lot of secondary uh, companies now are building out certifications. And then the other thing is, does the secondary uh, company uh, synthesize well with the platform, right? So is there tight integration with it? And are they built on top of you know popular technologies? It, it does seem like Kubernetes in particular does seem to be, you know, really spread out on a lot of different solutions here and so you can you can also look at this um you know st st strategic uh diagram here where you can see that like there's maturity platform play future play innovation right and you can see all these different companies and, and where they're at in that particular space now let's dig into the hiring and upskill strategy a little bit more which i because i do think this is an important uh, topic one of the things I would recommend for organizations is that they get uh, platforms uh, and, and certifications embedded into their organization. Uh, I, it's, I would say uh, an organization should have a couple different learning platforms. You know, O'Reilly, I'm, I'm obviously biased. I think it's a great platform. Uh, you know, may, maybe get another one as well uh, and encourage people in your company to get certified by paying for the certifications. Uh, I think this is really critical. Like there's all these things out there about uh, people uh, quiet quitting, you know, not wanting to participate at work. Well, I mean, in some sense, you could kind of look at the management and say, well, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> right. Or like most of the time, and there's research that points to that. The reason why people want to leave an organization is that the company is not showing a, a reciprocal interest in them. Right. And so are you actually giving your employees an opportunity to grow and encourage them to get certified, paying for their certifications, uh, having internal user groups with monthly tech talks and demos, uh, having yearly and quarterly goals. So by investing in your employees, uh, you're actually helping them uh, have more, you know, more of an incentive to stay. And in fact, uh, when I was working at Caltech, uh, one of the, the presidents of Caltech actually told me some career advice. He said, the the reason to leave a company or stay at a company is whether you're learning. As long as you're learning things, you should stay at a company. If you're not learning anything more, you should leave a company. Uh, and, and and I thought, wow, that's pretty good advice. Of course, you're the president of Caltech, so you, you probably would know. Um, and I think that's a, you know, a, a pretty big takeaway, which is if you're having people leave a company, well, are you investing in them learning? Uh, and also the the demos I think is another one that's that I do a lot in teaching, and especially with new things like this with MLOps, is by teaching people to demo in your organization constantly. You're improving metacognition, which is the ability to know what you know and what you don't know, right? And this is really critical uh, metacognition because it, it it allows you to move faster. Because if you don't know something because you're demoing it and realize, oh, I don't actually know that particular part of it, then you learn it and then it allows you to accelerate uh, faster. So let's talk a little bit about some of the key certifications for MLOps here. And I've, I've actually done a lot of work in this space and I'm gonna talk about that uh, in a little bit. So in terms of AWS, uh, I think three that are pretty good for MLOps would be the Solutions Architect uh, certification, also, the AWS machine learning certification and the data analytics certification. All three of these certifications, actually, I've created training material that's on the O'Reilly platform uh, that uh, covers each of these. Uh, and I, I think these are, are, are some of the best, right? That, that you're, you're not going to go wrong with getting these uh, certifications. I've taken them myself and passed these certifications or in some cases even helped write the certification. Uh, I've been involved with AWS for quite some time. And then some of the others that I think are pretty interesting, uh, and, and I have some of them that I've been working on. Uh, one of the ones I'm, I'm interested in is actually uh, Databricks has a now machine learning engineering certification, and I'll talk about that uh, very briefly. Uh, there's also um, uh, Snowflake has certifications. I think that's a very interesting company that's doing a lot in the MLOps space. ML Run uh, has a, not certifications, but they have a marketplace where you can actually build example applications that are MLOps focused. So I think there's a lot of, of interesting things there. 
Kubernetes would be a good certification to get. And then also the Google Cloud uh, professional machine learning uh, engineer. So I actually just took that and passed it. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second as well. So all these spaces, I think, are, are very interesting places for people that want to dive into MLOps. So let's talk a little bit about some of the future trends that I see uh, with, uh, with MLOps. So to start with, one of the things that I, th I think we're going to see here is that uh, the file system itself is going to be a lot more important than it used to be. And that's why I brought up at the very beginning how I started my career out with file systems. And uh, Caltech, this was 2000, had, I don't know, 50,000 users or something like that. And they all would use a centralized file system that was a, a Unix-based file system. And I learned how those those kinds of things work now it's coming back right where now you can do some very interesting things if you have a file system because the clusters themselves if they're training machine learning models or they're using data they can just mount the the file system and everything can be deployed by just copying the data directly on a file system so in some cases you know maybe like a thousand deep learning nodes that are training something could 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 work very very quickly right by by using uh, a file system. So I think this is a space to watch and potentially spend a little bit of time mastering is to, to get more and more familiar with the Elastic file system on AWS. Uh, there's also file systems for other cloud providers as well. Also the Kubernetes uh, workflow uh, is, a, I think, a very interesting one because it, it works well for large distributed systems, especially hybrid cloud-based uh, deployment systems. Uh, and uh, ML Run actually is a heavy user of uh, Kubernetes-based system, and, and this would be, uh, I think, a good technology to get some experience with, maybe get a certification around. I, I do think the future is going to have more and more ML ops with uh, Kubernetes. The other one that's a big one, too, that's a trend, is uh, edge-based machine learning. And I think what we're seeing is that edge-based systems, uh, so basically deploying to a phone, deploying to a device, et cetera, are, are a huge, um, uh, you know, uh, new trend that we're seeing. And, and what this means is that there's low latency when the model goes to a device. And so uh, basically you can do things that are, that are much more difficult than if you're talking to an endpoint somewhere else because of the fact that an endpoint could hop over, you know, maybe 100 different network access points but on an edge-based device, the model literally is right on the device, so it could be millisecond response time. So this is, I think, definitely uh, an area where we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, traction. Uh, the other one I think that's an interesting one that we're seeing is uh, this concept of sustainability. And this is a, an interesting um, space because on one hand, there there is, I think, a, a concerted, concerted move by some people to try to say that ESG uh, or sustainability investing is a bad idea, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, they also could have their own agenda for, for saying this. But the reality is that you don't necessarily need to be training models all the time yourself if somebody else has already trained the majority of it for yourself. And so this then starts to get into some of these topics like the environment again like why burn energy you don't need to burn social so you know have people already looked at some of the ethical issues or the uh, bias already in the model and kind of helped you with it and then governance right like is it actually going to be safe for people to use i think these are all really important factors with mlops and i think the regulation we're seeing from the eu is, is going to push a lot of this as well and then the big one, I think, that is uh, a trend that I'm really seeing a lot of, and I personally, uh, you know, am, uh, am pushing is this pre-trained model in AutoML. And in the case of MLOps in particular, you don't need to have built it to use it. Uh, food is a good example. You know, you could you could have uh, flour, right, where you could make a pizza dough, you could buy a frozen pizza or you could get pizza delivered, right? They're all the same thing, right? They're all, you're eating food. They, they were made in different ways, but the, the, the same concept uh, applies. So basically one of the things that, uh, that, that 
you know, I think I, I'm, I'm going to show today, in fact, is how to actually use pre-trained models uh, and AutoML uh, to your advantage. Uh, another one I think that's a big trend is this concept of model portability. And I think we're going to see this quite a bit as well, is that someone may have built the model with PyTorch and they convert it to TensorFlow or vice versa. And Onyx in particular is one of the, the, the technologies that, that we're seeing a lot of a, a lot of this happen around. And so uh, I think this is a good trend, right? Because then you have a standardized format for, for models. The other thing too is I, I think this concept of, you know, I'll call it the MLOps industrial uh, revolution here is that the, I think the cost potentially of certain things is going to go way down. Uh, but what we could see, and this is just one of the predictions that I have is maybe by 2025, you know, maybe AutoML becomes commodity. Like why is it we're paying money for AutoML? Doesn't, why, it, 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 to me, it doesn't really make sense because it's a, I think it, there isn't anything special about AutoML for the, for the most part. And, and this will probably go down and down and down. Likewise, probably pre-trained models are going to go down and down and down. It's going to be a commoditization or in perfect competition, all profit leads to zero. And so what we will probably see is people that are ML engineers, data engineers, that th they're going to be in demand as you're trying to utilize these systems. And I think a lot of times people get really hung up or angry about AutoML, like, oh, you're taking my job, just like with the Copilot, which I'm going to use in a little bit. I think you're thinking about the, the problem in the wrong way, which is that it's automating the model is, is not really that useful in some sense. You want to automate the entire system. So I would call that Kaizen ML, right? Which is you improve the entire system, not just improve the, the model. And so if you get hung up on this one part of it, you, you, you lose the, the, the main narrative, which is no, we're automating everything. That's the whole point of, of Kaizen ML, right? Let's improve the entire system, not just automate the machine learning model, because that's just one very tiny part of it. So what is the, the, the solution here it would be to have a production first mindset. So when you when you dive into a solution here, you, you dive right into uh, what it is that you're building. Uh, and you think about from the beginning that, you know, there's only a very small amount that is going to be things like AutoML. You, you probably want to have auto data engineering, automatic feature engineering, automated testing, automated deployment, automated elasticity, automated data drift detection, automated intelligence systems, right? So when you get into like, uh, when, when people get too focused on auto mail, they're lo again, losing the narrative here, which is every single thing in a software system gets automated. So the fact that we're now getting to, to, to machine learning, I mean, should not be a surprise, right? That's, that's what happens in software systems. The goal though, is to get the model in production. So the expert should look at the whole system and say what parts are not automated and then focus on that. So I think that's the, that's really the, the the mindset to have here when, when thinking about um, auto mill is that you need to have a production first mindset uh, when you're when you're building things out. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do next here is I'm going to dive into some 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 kind of cutting edge thoughts that I have. <clears throat> and so this is a new book that I'm working on, um, and I'll just show you the the name of the book which is, uh, it's gonna come out in, re in pre-release uh, here or early release in, I would say a couple weeks or something like that. It's called Implementing MLOps in the Enterprise. And we can just start, uh, and I'll show you some of the things that, that I'm gonna be talking about in it because I think they're, they're relevant. So one of them is that when you're evaluating uh, a technology platform, I see this come up quite a bit, is that, that people get too hung up on you know, the cost of the solution, but that's that's just like with getting hung up on auto mail is the wrong approach. You shouldn't get caught up on cost. What you should get caught up on is the ROI. And so here's one scenario is you have no value, no cost, no ROI. What happens? Well, you have nothing, right? He, nothing happened, right? So, so in the case of if it's free, right, open source, but it offers no value, then you didn't get anything from it. So, so there's no point. In a second scenario, you could have a really high value that you're trying to solve from some technology solution, but the cost is also very high. So it's, let's say $2 million. 
And then as a result, you have negative ROI. So you don't want to do that one either, right? So you have zero ROI, negative ROI. The sweet spot isn't the cost being nothing, right? It actually could be that you you have identified there's a million dollars of value uh, in a scenario. The cost of the system you're you're working with, uh, full you know hiring people, implementing it, etc., is half a million, and then you get a half a million in ROI. That's that's great. That's exactly what you want. You want to spend some money to make some money, and I think this is a very important thing to to think about is, is that you want to be very careful about cutting edge technology and and making sure that you're you're getting things at a positive ROI. That's one of the easiest ways to get burned. And if we scroll down here a little bit, this is where where the scenario comes in, into play. And this happens a lot in the real world. I've seen it as a manager. I might I might have even done this before <laughs> at an organization. So you you have uh, a bespoke system. So somebody builds something from scratch and that system has nothing to do with the organization. Let's say you're a telecom company or a manufacturing company, and then you build this like machine learning framework, right? Which I, th for, for some reason, a lot of, you see this a lot in Bay Area companies is like, oh, look, I built a machine learning platform and all this stuff. Well, it, what does that have to do with your core business? It, it may have nothing to do with it. And it doesn't mean they're not smart. They could be a genius, basically, or, or a brilliant person. The problem, though, is that if you really are that smart, one, the, that's not the core competency of your company. And two, they're probably going to get hired by another organization that pays 10 times more. And then now they're at a trillion dollar company, Apple, Google, etc. And guess what? Now that system, even though it was well designed, it'll probably break in three months. Once that once it breaks, guess what's gonna happen? Now you're gonna put in a proprietary system, the organization's gotta retrain on the new system, and then potentially the new system is even better than the bespoke one, even though the one that the engineer built is, is pretty good. And so I think that's something to think about is this idea of like one person who's a sole hero builds some system in, an, in a company unfortunately it's fantasy land, right? Like you don't want that to happen. What you really want to do is have some kind of a platform that you, or several platforms, as I mentioned earlier, where you're actually using that so that there's a, a commonality and continuity uh, in your organization so that after people leave, you still can hire people and still, still work on things. So I think this is really subtle, but important uh, note about MLOps. Now, the other thing that I'm going to mention a little bit too is this concept of risk and uncertainty in the enterprise, and uh, in particular, one of the one of the things that I'll I'll bring up here is this uh, uh, concept of the uh, naughty child problem that uh, the author of um, Black Swan, uh, Taleb, uh, wrote about, which is that a lot of times in an organization it's easy to get caught up into uh, you know, thinking that you know something in more detail than you actually know. And one of the problems that he brings up here is that, you know, a lot of times people will assume that they understand a problem because, you know, in the case of a container that has uh, black balls and red balls, if the container is, is closed and, and there's a fixed capacity for every ball that you pull out, if you randomly pull out a ball, it's true that you're getting more and more information about the true probability of the balls in the container, and you can be more and more certain about making some kind of a guess, like there's 60% red balls and 40% black balls or, or, or whatever. But the problem is in the real world is really that, that type of situ situation. We see this with MLOps in particular uh, is that, and, and this is the, the analogy that he brings up is, Imagine that someone is pulling all the balls out of, of the container, but what they don't realize is that there's a little kid at the bottom who's shoving in new balls, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so the, the adult thinks that they're getting more and more probability, uh, you know, uh, more and more confidence in the probability of you know, distribution, but in reality, they don't know anything, right? Because there's a randomness occurring 
uh, that's going into the, the container. And this is really reflective of a lot of the machine learning uh, problems in production is that if, if the data itself has been changing, and this is why you want to do data drift uh, you know, detection, then you're going to have an extremely difficult time uh, doing anything useful with the model because the model just doesn't reflect reality. And so it's important to be aware of, uh, of this, this concept of, of non-deterministic behavior with, with data and to be, uh, I guess, cautious when you're, when you're thinking about implementing a machine learning problem into, into production. And so if we go down here a little bit, um, I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of the uh, another diagram here uh, that th and this goes into some of the things that we talked about uh, just just briefly is that one of the ways that you can start to think of the world in MLOps is to is to is to leverage existing systems and I think in particular the cloud if it's a, a, a um, possibility for organization is one of the things that reduces the risk of MLOps. Not that you have to always use their MLOps solution, but that at least it's a background for, for, for doing some of the things uh, with MLOps. And so let's take a look at some of the, the capabilities that are available in an MLOps system from an enterprise pers perspective. So one, we have storage systems that are elastic and so what does that give you? You have the ability to do near infinite disk IO, storage, CPU, GPU, ASICs. Uh, likewise, you have elastic compute systems. So same thing, infinite disk IO. Uh, and so this, this near infinite capacity of storage and compute is one of the things that's gonna help you build deep learning systems, deploy things at scale. The other, there's also, I think, a subtle effect here that isn't talked about enough, which is the, the concept of uh, a network effect uh, when you're dealing with the, the cloud platforms and that they have managed services <clears throat> that are built on top, containerized services, managed services, serverless technology, and all of these technologies uh, really uh, allow for a huge uh, advantage in, in building things because they build on top of those other systems. Also, there's cloud development environments and cloud development environments are really amazing because they have deep integration with tools, deep integration with SDK, and you can do uh, as well, you have third-party vendor in integration. So once you've built on top of this ecosystem, you, you get these cloud development environments, you get third-party integrations, and you can actually scale and so we can see here that there's typically a couple different kinds of tool sets. We have developer centric, which would be like cloud shells, cloud IEs, uh, storage systems. We have Jupyter systems, which are more notebook and machine learning centric. And then there's MLOps platforms. So you see like a wide spectrum uh, of different things here uh, when you're dealing with a cloud landscape. Now, one of the things that I'll, I'll bring up real quick here is that, you know, if we look at Google Cloud, right? They have a terminal. Uh, they also let you hook into the APIs. Uh, there's shells that you can use that you could run training jobs, etc. Uh, this is going to be table stakes, I think, for most people doing MLOps. And in particular, same thing. Cloud Shell has it. Cloud IDE. You, you, they're just they really are ubiquitous. And so this now gets us into what I would say is really important to consider for an organization is the cloud developer workspace advantage. And uh, I think all organizations should be heavily thinking about where it is that you're developing your software. So are you developing your software uh, in uh, your workstations at your organization, or are you developing those the software in a cloud-based environment? The problem with a laptop, laptop or workstation is that one, it's non-deterministic. I've worked places in my career where it's taken a month for someone to get up to speed because their software uh, on their workstation was so complex to set up. And even people with like, you know, master's degrees from Carnegie Mellon, you know, like very intelligent people would take a month to get set up at work. That, this is really nonsense, right? We don't need to do that. Uh, the hardware costs a lot of money and also it's not the same deployment uh, target. 
when you get into the cloud though, we have all of these new environments that are very cutting edge that surprisingly not many people know about, but I'm gonna go into some of these. Uh, one of them is GitHub Code Spaces. I think GitHub Code Spaces has some of the most promise period for doing um, cloud-based developer workflows, especially with uh, MLOps and uh, AI programming, pre-trained models. You can use the uh, OpenAI uh, Codex, which is actually integrated into Copilot. So you can actually use AI to, to program AI. Uh, and, and that's one of the, the really huge takeaways is that uh, you, just like with, with uh, AutoML, of course we're gonna automate writing code. In fact, I'm gonna show some of that, <laughs> that if you know what you're doing, you're, you can be 10 times, 100 times faster writing code. So why wouldn't you use a tool that would do that? Likewise, the integrations built into here. So I think these are really powerful tools that are that are mainstream now. Also, the cloud environments are often more powerful than regular desktop environments. They're disposable. You can create tons of them. They're preloaded with all the different things that you want. And they come with every flavor, right? So if you're developing on AWS, use the AWS Cloud9 environment. They have a new tool as well called Code Whisper that's coming out that'll help you do AI-assisted programming. Uh, the Google Cloud uh, has a deep integration with their tool set. It's co-located. All these are co-located in the same network. So you don't have to worry about like copying data back and forth. Uh, and, and they're all lightweight and they're in the browser, right? And they're all loaded together. There also are these uh, other uh, things that I'll mention today and I'll, I'll cover, which are um, SageMaker Studio Lab, which is a notebook-based solution that's competing with Google Colab. Uh, and then there's Colab, which is a Jupyter-based solution that lets you use GPUs. So, and, and I think many people are aware of Colab, but I think it's worth just bringing up uh, for people who are not, is that what's nice about Colab is that it has deep integration with other uh, environments like GitHub, with Google Drive, etc. Uh, and it's a great place to actually just try out ideas. And in particular, one of the things that that I would recommend, uh, you know, knowing about, especially for for machine learning, is that you you have access to a gpu and so if if we take a look at this i have a i have the pro, pro version which gives me access to faster gpus if i connect to it one of the things i can do is i can actually go to uh, a runtime here and i can actually say <laughs> change runtime type and i can pick what type of runtime that i would like to use and so in this case we can see here that that i have the ability to use a gpu to use a TPU, right? These are uh, hardware accelerators. I'll pick GPU. And I also can uh, select a high RAM environment. So this is for the, the subscription. There's a free version as well. Uh, and if I go through here, once I've selected that runtime, it'll show me all of the details of what's happening right here. And so look, we can see here that I've got um, 25 gigs of RAM, which is a, a, it's a pretty uh, comprehensive amount of RAM. <clears throat> and I think I have uh, 166 gigs of storage as well uh, that are available and I have access to a GPU. So then when I run this, we can go through here and look, it even tells me exactly the the GPU that's available and, and says what percentage, what, what percentage of it is actually being utilized, etc. Uh, so, so this I think is a, a, a very common place to to play around with things. Now, as well as I mentioned before, you have access to high memory. So this really comes in handy if you're using pre-trained models. And if we take a look at this, it says, "Look, your runtime has uh, 27 gigs of RAM. You have you have high 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 memory." So the the main takeaway here is that this is a great place to train models. You know, use pre-trained models. And you can actually do a lot of the work uh, directly inside of a, a Colab notebook. Uh, and so if I was going to build maybe from scratch uh, a new environment and start to build out MLOps code, I think this is one of the tools I would start with. So let, let's go, go ahead and do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here. I'm going to go to my GitHub repo. And I'm going to create a new repo where I put uh, MLOps type artifacts. And so I'm going to go here. 
and I'm going to go to uh, repositories like this, and I'm going to say new repository, and we'll call this um, MLOps uh, starter environment. And what's nice about using uh, GitHub here is that it can directly integrate with Colab Notebook as well as the, the SageMaker Studio, which is also a notebook-based environment. So really nice uh, filter point for, for those environments. And also it works with um, their own cloud-based development environment. So let me actually diagram that out. I think that would be a, a good thing to explain. So I'm gonna go to uh, Sketchpad here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna sketch this out. So let's go over here and uh, let's let's build out a, a diagram of, of what this workflow looks like. So if you're if you're gonna build a uh, kind of an MLOps ecosystem for an organization or even for your own project, I think the center of the universe would be to do GitHub, right? Or 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 something similar like GitLab. I personally think GitHub is is pretty good. I'll put GitHub down here. And I, I think GitHub has some advantages if you're into technology, but in, in, the, in the center of the universe, we have GitHub. And then over here, we have Colab, which we're about to set up, which is a Jupyter-based service that can communicate back and forth with GitHub. And so why would I use Colab? Well, they have GPU and and RAM, right? They have very powerful machines here. And I'll put in the corner here, MLOps tools, right here, MLOps tools. So this is, this is a, a nice workflow. In addition though, we can also use uh, the SageMaker. So we'll, we'll just call this SageMaker here and it has Studio Lab, which is a similar product, like right here. And, and that can go back and forth. And, and so these, these would be uh, on the top here, these would be all notebook, right? These are all notebook based uh, environments, just like that, right? Now, in terms of a development-based environment, if I wanna go more on the software engineering side, which a lot of times for building uh, things with pre-trained models, you, you, you do wanna use a more dev kind of environment, we would, we would use an integration with uh, code spaces. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna also show in, in a second here is, uh, is, the, is the code spaces. And, and so what's great about that is we'll call this code space, is that it has the ability to uh, allow you to customize the environment. Uh, and also it allows you to use uh, Copilot, which can help you write code much quicker uh, as a result. So this is kind of the lay of the land and this is what I'm gonna set up very quickly. So now that we got that out of the way, let's, let's go back to uh, our environment here, MLOps starter environment. I'm gonna make this public and I would, I'm would i gonna say, uh, this is an example of a repo that can be used for MLOps. There we go. And I'll say readme file and we'll add Python file as well. And, and the git ignore is important so that you don't check in garbage and then add some kind of a license. I, I always like Creative Commons. There we go. We got it. We got it created. So the one of the first things that we can do to to check in code here uh, is that, and again, this is GitHub.com n o g i b j j m l ops hyphen starter environment, uh, which I can give to people. So the first thing I would do is check in a notebook. And so we, if we go back to this environment, 
I'm going to say file new notebook. And one of the nice things about Colab is that it is really great to build out the first part of a, of a data science structure. And so we'll call this uh, data science 101 right here, data science uh, 101. And I, when I teach a, a machine learning class or a data science class, I always tell people about this, that, that it's important to create um, a structure for your project. And I, I think it's important to do this. At the very beginning of your project, you have an ingestion phase. And so the ingestion would show you know, the first import of the data. And then you have exploratory data analysis phase. We'll call this EDA. And then we have a modeling phase, right, where you do some kind of modeling. And then at the very bottom, we have a conclusion. And I think this is a good structure for, for many people to consider because if you use the structure, you can always collapse things like this. And, and then you can share this with other people and there's a table of contents. And even further, if we go here and I check this into uh, GitHub, we have a link back directly to, to GitHub. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, save a copy in, in GitHub and let's let's try this out. So this will take just a second to build. There we go. And I think I have access. I, I may not have set up the integration with this repo and I always forget how to do that. I can see real quick. Um, we can say, how do I integrate with uh, GitHub? Let's see, frequently asked questions. Um, how do, do I integrate with GitHub? And this should give me, uh, and Colab. Let's see what they say. Okay, blah, 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 blah. So mount it, we got that, we got that, change the directory. Oh, you, we don't wanna do that. Well, it's not it's not that, that big of a deal. There's an easier way to download this. I just wanted to check it into the repo. All I have to do, this is actually another way you can, you can um, integrate with it. You can just say file and you can actually download as a .ipynb. And now I just go back to this repo and I can just say add file and I can also do it this way as well. So there's there's lots of ways to to integrate with uh, uh, Colab Notebook. And if I go ahead and I uh, commit this right from the, the browser, we'll have our start kit. There we go. And if I click on it, I think it'll even have the, well, it doesn't have the Colab link into it. That's the one the one thing you don't get, but you can just check it you know, directly into there. There's a way to integrate it uh, so that the, the Colab link always shows up. Uh, this particular repo, I didn't, this organization, I didn't set it up, but I have it in other organizations. But that's the first thing to, to be aware of is that, is that it is a good idea to, to you know, when, when appropriate, use Colab to, to try out different ideas. And in fact, the other thing about Colab is that there are, if you go to, um, the uh, tutorial here, which I think there's an example, let's see here, of different tutorials. Let's see here. Frequently asked questions. Let's look for the tutorial. We'll just say Colab tutorial. There, There's a bunch of um, examples that uh, that are good to to take a look at that show you some of the things you can do, uh, including, you know, using integration with uh, with uh, machine learning systems, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, if you go to the machine learning uh, machine learning collab as well, um, there 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 will be uh, there we go Google collab for machine learning projects. There's there's a bunch of example notebooks you can Google for and you and you get a lot of uh, different things for collab. 
So that's that's collab. Now let's 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 shift gears here over to SageMaker Studio Lab. If I go to SageMaker Studio Lab, there's another place to 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 do things in, in a free environment. And this is an emerging product that that I think is is really great for working with machine learning. And you do have to request a free account, so there is a waiting list. Um, I do have a free account, but I, I, there, I have no guarantee that someone will get access to this. But uh, let me just show you the way it, the way it works. So if I sign in here, uh, if we take a look at this, what's cool about it is that GPU runtime limits have changed. You can use a GPU for up to four hours at a time and up to eight hours in a 24 hour period. So what's cool is you, you get actually free GPU uh, available uh, with SageMaker Studio Lab and let's go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and select GPU. And and now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start my runtime. Let's go ahead and oh, there's no runtime available. So it looks like people are doing deep learning training uh, on the GPUs. So I'll just go ahead and do a, a CPU runtime. So that's one of the things about a free service is sometimes that happens. They Somebody's, you know, a lot of people are, are using the free service. And so you have to be prepared to, to use the, the CPU only runtime, which I think in some cases it works, works, works very well. Okay, so we got the SageMaker Studio Lab set up and let's take a look at some of the things that you'll, you'll have at your fingertips when you're, when you're doing things inside of um, SageMaker Studio Lab. So the, the first thing to be aware of is it runs uh, Jupyter Lab. And so there's a there's an integration here directly with uh, Jupyter Lab. So in some sense, it's it's much less proprietary than than Colab, uh, and it also gives you uh, the ability to save the state. So if you're training a model inside of this environment, uh, it, you can actually retrain it in the future and have checkpoints, and you don't have to worry about uh, the the problem with Colab where basically everything goes away because it's it's a, a reset environment. So that's a, a pretty big uh, advantage here of uh, this environment. Now, the place that I think is a good place to start <clears throat> is to go to the initially the SageMaker Studio Lab uh, uh, examples here. And if we go ahead and we take a look at this, we can say, uh, let's take a look at the, um, the getting started guide and let's see what they say here. So here's the getting started uh example it says your SageMaker environment has 25 gigs of storage uh cpu or gpu runtime it has integration with git repos conda jupyter lab extensions and you can just go ahead and like start running code so if i do a shift return here you can see here i was able to run code <clears throat> and you can also create your own notebooks and then integrate them directly as well so you can also download things and check them into a project. So if I just took this, a notebook here, and I just say file um, download, getting started, we could also go to this notebook uh, or, or repo, and I could also add this, upload the other environment as well. And, and now we have the SageMaker Studio Lab and we have Colab, we've, we've tried them both out and they're both integrated inside of here. Now there is there is a way that um, that they can add a link to SageMaker Studio, uh, which I don't know where that link is off the top of my head. But there is a way to actually have a little badge here uh, as well for the for the so that it'll open up automatically in, in this kind of environment. Now there are a couple things that are that are pretty cool about this as well. Like one, you can actually go to the new and you can actually even just run a regular terminal, which is different again than, than uh, Colab. This is more of like a, you know, like a, a sandbox environment. And if I wanted to run, you know, like the top command or something like that, I could, I could see what's, what's going on on my machine and, you know, do other things that, that are, that are related to it. But it's, it's a nice starter kit for, maybe moving eventually things to the the more commercial platform of uh of SageMaker uh and so I think this is a, a pretty good environment so so probably one of the things that would be fun to play around with here is to just take a look at uh one of the examples here 
And so let's take, I don't know, like um, natural language processing. Here we go, NLP disaster recovery. And so let's go ahead and select this. And this would be fine tuned uh, locally for machine learn learning translation on COVID-19 health data by using Hugging Face. So, so notice here what's pretty cool about this is that uh, it, it actually allows us to integrate with the pre-trained models. So I think we're going to see a lot of this now, how pre-trained models are going to be a big deal. And so this one, it says, look, this notebook is designed to run on a G4 DN X large GPU. If you're not using that, please restart and help train your model in a matter of minutes rather than hours. So we, we probably don't want to use this one <laughs> because uh, it, it is actually going to do GPU. It, it would, it would, it would, it wouldn't finish uh, essentially, but we can take a look at this. And so the, we, we can run everything except for the, the GPU code. So the first thing would be install all the ne necessary packages. So if we go through here, it's gonna write out a requirements file and this would be a common uh, step. And then it's gonna go through and it's gonna do a pip install uh, and notice that it's gonna install the, um, the PyTorch library as well as it's gonna install uh, hugging face transformers the hugging face transformers would allow you to interface with uh, the pre-trained model so it's got a tight integration with some of the the cutting edge stuff that's happening in terms of um, you know pre-trained models and so this will take just a second you'll see here and in fact we could we could even have an, another shell running at the same time who we wanted to watch you know what my system is doing I could just do this and I could just double check. It doesn't look like it's doing anything. I think it must have installed. There we go. So it looked like it, it installed. <coughs> and now we're gonna import IPython. So please make sure to restart your kernel using the newly installed. So I'm assuming that we want to restart this kernel then. You may need to restart the term kernel. Okay, so let's do that. Let's say restart kernel. And let's see what happens. And now we can we can do this. And then it says explore the available data sets uh, on translators without borders. Now we need to download a pair you would use for training uh, a language translation model. Here we go. So here's the path to the data. We would, we would get the data. And notice how quick it is as well because it, it's on the AWS ecosystem. And then we can go through here, grab this data and uh, uh, unzip it. And then finally extract uh, the, the different stuff, parse it. You know, so so you, you get the idea here. The, the idea here is that you, you basically for free get access to uh, a complete uh, environment that you can use to train and customize uh, machine learning models. Uh, and and the, then the, the, the step three would be, now we would use Hugging Face and go through Hugging Face and, uh, and do all the training. Now, we're not gonna be able to do this because as I mentioned uh, before, we'll just run through some of this code, it, is that we don't have access yet to a GPU but we'll just take a look at what it would look like. So fine tuning the machine learning trans translation model. I think this is really what we're gonna see in the future is more of fine tuning versus training uh, completely from scratch. And so this is what I won't run, but if I did, did have access to a GPU, uh, although I guess I could run this on Colab or something like that, full training hugging face trainer available right here. You would, you would go ahead and run this translation you would uh, give it the path to the model. You would say what it is you wanted, to, wanted it to do. And then you would say how many uh, epochs to run. And then it would go through and it would, it, would, it would run it. And then at the very end, you would actually then import the model that you fine tuned and then ba basically go ahead and do an evaluation. So these, these um, notebook based environments are really powerful. And, and I, I think they are uh, a, a big part of the future of some of the things that we're going to be doing in the, with machine learning operations. Now, as I mentioned before, this is the CoLab SageMaker Studio. There's there's another one 
too, like everybody does these notebook based environments is Databricks, I think is another one that I think is an emerging um, solution. And, and so let me just briefly show that one as well. So if we go to um, Azure here and I go to, to Databricks, um, let's just kick the tires on what that looks like. So Databricks similar in a similar fashion has uh, this concept of a notebook based workflow and you would also do similar things you know you would go through create a notebook you know test or whatever and, and then inside of that notebook you would attach to a cluster of machines in this case and then you would you would do your your training jobs and then what will happen is that it would actually give get access to uh, the, the file system which is right under data right here and it would it would mount in fact uh, a database file system inside of databricks and then finally it would train a model and it would put that model inside of uh, a registry uh, right here so this kind of takes it to the next level which is still notebook based but the models are living in a uh, more of a, a proprietary uh, based system so that would be a good thing to maybe sketch out real quick if we go, in fact, I don't, even, I don't even need to sketch out because I already have a diagram of this. Let's let's go ahead and take a look at this. Let me let me uh, show you a diagram of uh, Databricks zero to ML ops, and I believe it's right here. Um, Let's go to um, is it this slides right here slides? Yeah, this would be a, this would be a good one to show. <clears throat> so, it, it, the, essentially, with with uh, Databricks, and and I'll just maybe demo this real quick. That the notebook based workflow uh, is in fact. Uh, a, a huge component of, of building out uh, machine learning for, for many platforms. And so some of the things to be aware of is that, you know, in terms of Python, it by itself is, is very slow. And in addition, that, uh, you know, Omdale's law, which is the concept of distributing things, isn't always going to be the perfect solution. And you can see here that Python can be you know, 64,000 times slower than C. And we also see that distributed computing has also gone down and, and we have problems with uh, distributed uh, computing. And so one of the answers is these things I just showed, right? These TPUs, GPUs, those kinds of things. Uh, and also specialized systems like, uh, you know, high level uh, machine learning systems. Now Databricks, what it really does if we take a look at this is it's a it's a managed system that does clusters and in particular uh, you could either have a single node a standard or a high concurrency cluster and you can pin the clusters you can do custom containers uh, but in in general the the idea with with databricks is you spin up a cluster and you do a quick start and if we click on the quick start guide here we can take a look at this is that uh, there's a there's a notebook that kind of walks you through uh, how to create a cluster, how to create a notebook, then how to run SQL to to do things with it, and then eventually uh, train a model. So that's that's kind of the high level you know lay of the land here. And, and I guess it would be worth sketching this out is that is that there there always is going to be a layer with MLOps that involves some kind of a notebook. And so, in fact, let's just build let's just build this out and just say, you know, a notebook for for ML ops is probably going to be involved with 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 any ML ops workflow, just because of the how how useful they are. Just they're just one of the tools, and so one of them it could be, you know, uh, collab could be one. Uh, it could also be uh, the we'll, we'll just say SageMaker Studio Lab, just because there's a lot to write <laughs> right there. And then we also have uh, Databricks, and we'll just also say DB since it's a lot to write. 
We also have just traditional SageMaker. Well, let's call this SG uh, is, an, is a notebook. Uh, we, we have um, things like Azure ML Studio uh, is another one. Azure ML Studio uh, is another one. And then uh, we, we have uh, Google also has something called Vertex AI. So these are all uh, legitimate places. We'll call this Vertex AI, Vertex AI, places where, where you're actually going to use a notebook. Now, in general, though, the notebook-based workflow, you know, what are the primary use cases? We'll call this use cases would be that you're going to train a model, right? So you're going to train a model or you're going to uh, fine tune a model, right? Those are those are generally the the use cases that that you'll see here. And so, uh, and there's also um, Snowflake as well. We we also could put in Snowflake. Snowflake uh, is another one, right? That has a notebook based work w workflow. But if you're going to get into developing uh, code. Uh, there's some other tools like cloud-based development environments that are that are available. So I'm going to focus more in, in this talk today about the more of the developer-based workflow. But I did want to just briefly mention that you know a lot of people are using notebooks for for, for things. Although some of the newer tools are more um, code-based. And so let's now shift into the the development environment world. So I'm in here, right? I've got some things checked in, but now I want to start doing development inside of a, a cloud-based development environment. How would I do this? One way to do it is to go to this, go to code here. And this is a, a code space that I use as a teacher. Um, we, we get access to code spaces. You can purchase a, a code space from uh, GitHub. Uh, it's a great place to do development work. Organizations like uh, corporations can, can select them. If I, if I click on this button right here, and I go to configure and create code space, I could actually uh, make a, a pretty powerful code space. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to say a 16 core machine, and we'll go ahead and say create code space. All right, here we go. And let's make this thing big. So the idea here is once you create a, a code space uh, inside of an environment like this, this is really kind of a dream scenario for MLOps uh, because of the fact that of how much you can customize it, what are the things you can do with it, how you can use uh, pre-trained models, uh, you know, and, and I find myself gravitating towards it. So the first thing I typically do is just change the color theme. And I actually like, this is kind of like a beta theme here because for accessibility, I think it's good to... Um, to do additional color themes. And we, we can say um, GitHub or Visual Studio, Visual Studio. You, you, can, you can pick whatever color theme you want, but uh, let's, let's pick color theme, dark Visual Studio. Uh, anyway, that's good enough. Dark Visual Studio is good enough for me. There was a really cool, cool one though. That was like that was a um, that I that I liked, which was a beta, um, a beta one that was like for accessibility. But I don't see it anymore. They they must have changed it. And, unless unless it's somewhere else here. But anyway, we we got it. The, the first thing I would do when I'm when I'm going into one of these kinds of environments is to, to start to customize the environment. So how would I do that? Well, one of the ways I could customize it is by doing shift command P, which will add this uh, command prompt. I, I forget if it's, or is it just um, command P? No, it's shift command P, yes. Yeah, shift command P, which adds the command prompt. And one of the first things I would recommend is to customize your GitHub code spaces environment. So I'm gonna say, um, uh, dev container. In this case, uh, this this is the the thing I want. Configure the development container features, and so what we'll do is we'll add 
uh, basically a customized uh, container development environment. So if I go here and I say show all definitions, we could pick all kinds of different things. So we could pick like Jupyter uh, data science environment. If I was gonna do a lot of Jupyter programming, I could pick Python environment. If I wanna do Python programming, all kinds of really, really cool stuff that you can do inside of this particular environment. I'm gonna select Python 3 here because I'm gonna do more of a developer workflow to start with. And then I'm gonna pick the latest version of Python. Notice it asked for Node. I don't really care about that for now. Uh, but this is another thing to be aware of is that uh, you can do a lot of uh, coding with cloud providers. And I'm gonna get into that today. And, and I'm, I'm gonna show how you can actually do uh, development with other cloud environments. So if I wanted to, for example, do development with AWS, I could just click this button. And then later I would need to install my my uh, API keys. And uh, we'll go ahead and say, okay. So here we go. It says, hey, we noticed you've made some changes. Uh, and then I, I could decide if I was good with the changes that were made. And really the two files that are important to change would be the dev container JSON file here and the Docker file. The the big one to be aware of here is that um, this is where I would install different packages right here. And so be, because I've already customized this in the past, I'm, I'm gonna copy some stuff from another project. So I'm gonna go to here. I'm gonna copy one I did recently that uh, is, um, AWS related, and I'm, I'm gonna look at my uh, dev container file here. So this is what's nice about this is other people could clone my project and they could take some of the things I've done. So I'm gonna look at this Docker file and I can see, oh look, I made this line of code right here that I actually wanna copy. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's go back to this Docker file and, and we can just put that uh, line of code right here. There we go, so run uh, the update and then install Vim because I like to use Vim for editing config files. So that's one change I'll make. And then if I go to the other file as well, I can go to my environment. And if we go to the uh, dev container environment, it creates a JSON file that I can customize. And I could look at what I've changed in here. I think the big thing I changed was I added some extensions. So these are capabilities of the environment. and. I personally think that um, the uh, Copilot is probably one of the biggest ones that I would that I would recommend. But let's let's just go ahead and install these two uh, tools here. Uh, I could probably do raw so I don't mess up my formatting. So I'm going to go to this. That looks good. And if I go back to this environment. We could look at the extensions and I could just copy and swap that out. And we can say MS, nah, we don't need C sharp in this environment. So then the only other thing that I'll need to do that I like to do is a post install command so that I like to, I like to set up a, a virtual environment in, in when, when I, when I set up a new environment. So what I'll do next is I'm going to create a requirements file in my project. And I'm going to create a make file so that I actually have the ability to um, really kind of have it all ready to go when, when this thing re resets. And so if I scroll down here, see this command right here, I can actually say, create a virtual environment, um, go ahead and uh, put the virtual environment in my bash RC file, which is right here, and then run make install so that everything installs. Uh, and this should this should work if I go back here and I just paste this in into this right here. So as long as there is some stuff inside of my um, make file, which is empty right now, and there's stuff in my requirements file. So I'm gonna change that real quick. I'm gonna go to this uh, he project here. I'm gonna select the make file like that. And I'm gonna paste this in. So why would I do a make file? The idea here is that it's less work to have certain steps that I run all the time. So I like to install my software here. 
I like to have tests for my software, format it, lint it. Um, and, and then for the requirements, I also can look at that other project and just see if there's some requirements that are probably gonna be something I'd wanna use. And we can look at these like Bodo, that's to talk to AWS, which I'll get into in a little bit. PyLint, Click, some testing tools, maybe like Fast API because I want to to build a, you know like a web service, uh, the request library, you know OpenAI to do AI programming, maybe Hugging Face Transformers. Like these are all kinds of things that maybe I want to put in there at first. I'm just going to copy. Um, I'm going to copy, sure, let's copy all of these. Why not? And uh, I go back to my other project and go to requirements and we paste them in there. So now that I've got all those inside, I just could do the shift command P again and I would say rebuild. Uh, there we go, code space rebuild container. And so what it's going to do is going to run all those commands that I set up. And now it's going to be permanently stored in my project. So basically I, I always can restart from, from again i could even clone this project uh and it's 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 devops and ml ops friendly so i think this cloud-based development environment is a is a pretty huge win in fact uh for for doing ml ops especially when you start to get into pytorch tensorflow those kinds of libraries it can really be complex to set things up and not only can you do this, but you can even create this as a container and even push this into uh, the GitHub environments and they can store the container so it'll build really quick. So you can see here, this will take uh, a little bit of time to, to go through and, and run all this stuff and get it all set up and install the tools and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but in my opinion, it's worth it because not only did I create my development environment here, here we go, looks like it's getting ready to get going here but i also can build tests against this so here we go and look it even created my virtual environment for me which is awesome installed all this stuff and it installed one of my favorite tools which is um if we go to extensions here uh look we have copilot installed which means that i can write code very very quickly uh and so we're we're basically in a great spot here for for me to take another break so let's let's uh let's take a break for 15 minutes and we come back what i'm going to do is i'm going to start building code from zero that is using pre-trained models and solves problems using pre-trained models with both open ai and with hugging face uh, and so i'll do it inside of this uh, code space environment so if you have any questions about any of this or if you have access to code spaces you know, you can you can take a look at this repo and just uh, clone it uh, if you want, and uh, and keep moving. So, if we go to this environment right here, <clears throat> so I've got all this stuff set up. You can see I was able to install some certain things inside of the code space environment, and uh, like why would I do this? And and really, what is what does it get us? Well, I think the big thing is that once you've got this kind of environment uh, set up here that it does make it easier to start doing you know ai level uh, programming and using some of the some of the new technologies and so let me just briefly show you two two different pre-trained model uh, ecosystems one is the um, open ai and the second one is hugging face so to start with i'm going to go over to Hugging Face, and let's talk a little bit about what Hugging Face is. So Hugging Face is is pretty interesting because it's like GitHub, but for doing uh, data sets and for doing models. And if we look at this, we click on models here, one of the things that you can do with models uh, is you can you can see that it's growing like uh, a very fast, uh, you know, pace here, that there's, there's just all kinds of different things that are being solved in an open source way like image classification image segmentation speech recognition token classification audio classification summarization you know all this stuff here libraries pytorch tensorflow jax all, all these kinds of libraries as well there's different data sets that you can download different languages 
so so there's a there's a ton of features now in, in here you can use a free account and if we go through here we can see the different things that you get with hugging face uh, I think this is probably good for a lot of people if you just want to try out Hugging Face. I, I have this one uh, so that uh, I have the higher ability to do inference uh, via the API. Uh, and I also um, have, have been playing around with this new feature called Spaces. And I'll show you this real quick. So what's what's cool about the, the Spaces environment is that you don't even need to use, um, you know, Copilot and code spaces and all that kind of stuff with GitHub, you could just develop uh, right inside of here. And uh, I, I guess what we could do is just play with this real quick and I could show you how you would build one. So if you want to create a new space, um, actually it might be better to just look at how one works first. So here's spaces of the week here, but I could also go most likes and we can see that this is one of the ones that a lot of people have been playing around with, which is called st uh, Stability Diffusion. And if we kick, take a look at this, the, the reason why it's so cool is you can build AI art with it. So if I wanted to do like, for example, uh, you know, Mickey Mouse um, combined with, um, I don't know, like, uh, like a horror film or something <laughs> so so i want to i want to combine some weird things like it, it it would go through and 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 try to make some kind of a creepy mickey mouse uh image for me and so behind the scenes though while this thing is working i can actually open this up in a new tab so this will still be cranking that i can see exactly what was was done to to create this so we can see that there's an app file right here and this is using the visualization uh, technology Gradio, which builds the UIs. We have some uh, code here that are imports, like this is the uh, PyTorch code. And then there's only a little bit of code here, right? Like there's an, there's an infer right here that does the, the, the stuff. And then there's some coloring for the prompt. And so the other, only other thing you would need to care about would be the requirements right here. And you just need to have these requirements in installed in your in your space here. So pretty easy to do a a, a hello world a hugging face. And so you can either run it in here or you can run run hugging face uh, locally. We'll, we'll actually do both. So if I go back here, I don't know how long this will take to to build, but uh, it, it's funny. It doesn't it doesn't show me the. The amount of time it'll take to build it but it can take anywhere from um you know like 60 seconds to a few minutes i'll, I'll give it a little bit of time here uh and l let this keep running and, and maybe we'll come back to it so what i'll do is i'll just make my own space while that thing's running so i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to go to spaces here and i'm going to say create new space and we'll call this uh you know how about summarization summarize test and uh i don't know what creative creative commons there we go and and then you pick what is the visualization technology you want to use uh, i i usually use gradio because that's the one that's supported most closely with hugging face and they would go ahead and say create space and then from here it'll give you like the start of a of a project to to play around with now one of the things you can do actually is you can actually build this directly inside of the browser so you you don't actually have to to clone it and so uh, if i if i go through here and i copy this code here and i say create it we can just paste that inside just like that and uh, i'll go ahead and commit this and let's see if this will build for us uh, there we go and i don't know if I even need a requirements file. I may not if I just use uh, if I if I just use this. And notice you can see that it's actually building, uh, and you can even watch the logs right as it's building as well. So you can build stuff completely inside of Hugging Face and try out their different models uh, with without actually even needing to go, uh, you know, to a local environment. So we'll let this thing uh, build for a second. It's, it's still building. I guess I can go back and forth and see which one does. So this thing's still building. 
So we'll, we'll just kind of go back and forth and see which one builds first. So uh, this should take hopefully just a second. I don't think it needs, you, you can add a requirements uh, if needed. You can also add a packages, uh, it, but it does say that Gradio is pre-installed with this. So there you go, running. So I think it's good. So if I go here, summarize test, right? Uh, you know, hello, submit. There you go. Right. So it does. It does nothing. Now I, I had previously built uh, a um, a uh, example here. So if we go to this, and I go to, I think it's this one demo. Let's let's see if this is the one that I have. Uh, yeah, I think this is the one that I built a, a while back. So it's a summarization. Uh, one. So what I do in this case is I say from transformers import pipeline, import Gradio. I then select one of the models. So you could you could basically just go to the models right here, and you just find you know one of the models here. Like in this case, I could say you know summarize like that, and I would just find some some model that I want to use to do text summarization, probably sorting by you know downloads or something like that. And then uh, I do a prediction. In this case, this is a prompt, and then it builds out uh, a user interface. So, so this is, in my opinion, still ML ops, right? But we're just fast. We're we're, we're um, getting into the fast lane, and we're building something uh, very quickly. And if we look at the requirements uh, here, you can see what's in the requirements: Gradio, Transformers, TensorFlow. Uh, and so, if I want to, if I want to test the app out. We would just enter the block of test, uh, a text to summarize. So what I could do is I could go to the Python language. Let, let's do that. Let's go to um, Wikipedia and let's just type in uh, Python and let's find the Python language. Here we go. Python programming language, right? This looks like a good page. Let's let's grab, uh, I don't know, let's grab a bunch of this text here. Let's. I don't know how much of it do we care about. How about just this part? We'll, we'll grab here. History. There we go. And if I go to my app, where is my app? Here. We paste that in. We can just say submit. And then what it's going to do is going to use that pre-trained model, go through crunch, 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 crunch. And it, it, it takes. It does take a while because of uh, it's it's uh, got a. This particular part of the problem is not uh, particularly quick, uh, but then it's going to eventually summarize it. So while it's summarizing, I can go back here, and we can take a look at this. Wow, uh, it's still still crunching this one as well. So we have two two slow models here uh, being being um, used for inference. There we go. So we, we we this one actually finished quicker. It says Python was conceived in the 1980s by uh, Guido van Rossum at Centrum Informatica in the Netherlands. The programming language. So this basically was able to summarize the history and shrink it to uh, a form that I could use. Now what's cool about these demos as well that you build is one you can show people that you know how to build, you know, machine learning. Uh, applications, uh, but you also can um, integrate it with GitHub. And I do have a, a repo that does that, uh, that, that does a full end-to-end -end, uh, solution. And so what I can do is open up another tab here, slide this over, and go to GitHub and just show you a hugging face one that I built a, a while back. And we go here and we say, you know, hugging uh, hugging face CLI with, uh, uh, let's see, hugging face demo, probably this one. Yeah, I think this is the one that I have. And so this is actually the same project. So I can update it inside of this environment and I can open it in code spaces, run it locally, and then push this directly to code sp to, um, to hugging face. And how, do, how can I do this? Well, if I go to, to this right here, Hugging face workflow. Take a look at what I do. So I actually have a, a file that um, checks out my code. I added the remote. I have a secret built into my project. 
inside of my GitHub environment and I push this every time I make a change. So if I want to, I can actually edit this file as well. So might as well, since, since I uh, have talked about it, and you can see how the project works, which is that uh, I have a spaces app right here and it is using Gradio and it does text summarization. That's what we covered. And the other thing I can do though, is I can also use Hugging Face, get an auth, auth token, and I can push that auth token into the secrets environment of here. And I can develop it in a more rich environment uh, and I can grab any model that I want and whenever I make a change, it'll push that change back to the, the spaces environment. So I also can do a full uh, MLOps pipeline. So just because I didn't create the model myself, does, in my opinion, doesn't mean it's on MLOps. We're still building you know, uh, a solution uh, with, with Hugging Face. So I think this would be a good one to, to play around with here as well. So let's see if, if we got our, our, our final thing built. Anyway, this, this thing may take forever, but it is cool to play around with if you want to play around with AI-generated art. I've done all kinds of them. I don't know how long this one will, will, will take. Um, now, the, I guess the next thing for us to do is, is let's see if we can, we can build some stuff now with, uh, with Hugging Face. And in fact, I've, I've got an environment that I was working on uh, that, that I'm just gonna launch because it's got everything that I need inside of there. And I believe it is this one. Let me, let me double check. Uh, is this the one? Or is it heuristics? Let's see here. I think this is the one. Yeah, this is the one I was working on. So I have I have an environment that's kind of similar. That that in inside of here, look, it's got an app. It's got all kinds of things inside of here. Uh, this could be a repo that allows me to build tools on top of of hugging face and. In fact, here we see all the different things that I've that I've got inside of here. So let's let's go ahead and launch this code space, which is similar to the one I just set up, and let's let's take a look at how we could also build hugging face models by by using um, a, a local version of it, but a local version that's running in a cloud-based development environment. Okay, so we're in here, and we've got this environment set up here. Now, a couple things that I'm going to point out are that there's not a lot of code. So the, f the only thing that I, that I have here is I've put the transformers, which is the, uh, is the library to talk to Hugging Face. I have a command line tool. I have TensorFlow. I also use Beautiful Soup to parse pages. I have a library called Wikipedia, which can grab pages like the one I just did, like the uh, Python page. I have linting for PyLint and I have IPython. So I think this would be a good one to, to kind of mimic to if you wanted to develop against it. And I don't need to do any secrets or anything because I'm just gonna use models that already exist. I don't, there's no authentication. So this is completely replicatable. And I also did similar things like I have a, an environment that's customized and, and, and all that stuff inside of here. So let's go ahead and, and kick the tires and, and take a look at what, it, what actually is built here. So the first thing, is that uh, I import the command line tool library, and then I also uh, build a uh, an import from Hugging Face. So, so this is import transformers. Now it is weird that it's um, it's uh, it's not recognizing that I've got all these libraries, but we don't care about that for now. I then wrote uh, some code here that extracts text from a URL using beautiful soup. So any URL we pass in here, it'll return back the text. And then I have a function that uses Wikipedia to return a page. And then I have something that actually goes through here and processes the text using this kind of similar code to what was happening in the, in the, in the spaces thing. Uh, and then uh, this will actually go through here and it will, it will sum print the summary text. Now, the next thing that I like to do is I add a command line tool that allows us to either pass in a URL, pass in a file, or pass in a Wikipedia page, right? So either of those three things can get summarized. So now we're actually using this to use 
uh, to build useful tools. And I can also summarize uh, text by by using this tool. So let's try it out, right? So let's let's go through here. I'm going to try this one out first. I'm going to say uh, dot main. So we're going to pass in the uh, the URL for the Python language here. And I think I need to put this in quotes so that it uh, won't mess up. So there we go. So we're, we're going to tell our hugging face summarizer go to Wikipedia, read the page for me, do my homework for me, and then summarize it for my book report, right? We can go through here, and this should go through here and uh, and summarize it. And because, again, this is a super powerful environment, uh, it should at least be able to 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 handle some some problems fairly well, even though it's you'll you will see a lot of weird output because hugging face is still a little bit science fiction here. You'll see like all kinds of weird output, and you just have to kind of ignore that stuff. And we'll let this thing keep running. But at the very very end, it will print out uh, the results. So in this case, we're, we're actually parsing in the URL, but I could have actually just put in any Wikipedia page as well because I have code for that. But let's first watch it summarize. There we go. So so look, it says Python is a high-level general purpose programming language. It supports multiple programming paradigms, right? So this is pretty cool that just in you know 70 lines of code or whatever, I can build this. And then if I want to call it the other way, so if, if I want to call it, by just passing in a Wikipedia page, we can do that as well. So if I if I um, maybe open up another page here and we just go to Wikipedia and we just find whatever whatever is a popular page today, um, sure. But we'll, we'll, this is some kind of like an anti-nuclear advertisement, which is always a good thing to be aware of. So let's let's paste this in and we'll just say this and we'll paste the um, Wikipedia page in so we don't have to put a URL or anything this this one will be smart enough if I put in the flag Wikipedia to to use the function that uh, will summarize it there we go and no such option a oh, wiki page sorry wiki page I have the wrong option wiki page which maybe is a bad word. So this will then go through, goes to the Wikipedia library, grabs it, gets me the text from it, then passes it into the pre-trained model. Yeah, this is weird though. All this like, uh, all this, uh, all this output. Now I'm I'm curious if I, if I did an update and I changed the version, if that would if that would fix things which I might do. But let, let's go ahead and try this out. There we go. Look, pretty cool. Daisy is a controversial political advertisement that aired on TV. It was criticized for using the prospects of nuclear war to imply he would wage a nuclear war. The ad is considered one of the most important factors in Johnson's landside victory. There we go. So uh, I got a really good summary that I could tell maybe somebody in elementary school about some kind of a political advertisement. Uh, so some pretty pretty useful little tool here. And uh, also if I want to check the DevOps components, right? Because I, I mentioned that earlier, you know, we can we can we can check it out. We can say, okay, is my code high quality? Uh, let's let's go ahead and say yep, yeah, pretty good high quality code. We the linting works well. Uh, then if I wanted to as well, I could also set up uh, continuous integration. Uh, and, and make sure that as I make changes that uh, I still am continuing to to have high quality code. So let's let's go ahead and do that. I think that would be a good thing to play around here with with hugging face is to to set up the next level of of things that that we could do. So I'm going to go back to this, go to GitHub, and I'm gonna find this repo. <clears throat> and I'm going to uh, go to the Hugging Face repository. 
login phase. Here we go. And inside of this repository, I'm going to select this icon right here, which has actions. And 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 actually, I've already set this up, so we don't need to do it. So so basically, what what this will do is is that it's going to use the environment that I've customized that I showed earlier that will allow us to install the code, lint the code, test the code, and format the code automatically. So every time I make a change, we ha we're, we're continuously improving the output of the project. So this is something I would always recommend in a GitHub kind of environment is to make sure that you're doing continuous integration, and this is a, a format to do this. So now that I got that working, I think maybe the next thing to do would be to show how I built this tool and, and to build it again. So um, I think the first thing that we could do is we could build a new file and we could just call this, um, you know, HF CLI uh, example like that. Hugging face CLI example. Perfect. Uh, although I, I'm going to do, I'm not going to have the hyphens. And, and let's let's just make this without any it's, that way i have a lot of flexibility if i want to import it or whatever so we'll call this h hugging face cli um there we go that's pretty good hugging face cli and then if i click on this uh now i can start to use this ai uh assistant which is which is copilot we haven't even tried it out yet and so the what i would need to do is maybe prime the pump a little bit so Let's, let's give it a few things that I'm going to need. Like one is I'm going to add a shebang line, which says that I'm going to make a command line tool out of this. So I'm going to go ahead and chmod that. Uh, chmod plus X, HF. And then I'm, and I'm going to, now if I run it, it should just do nothing, right? Like, which is what I want. And then I, I might want to, um, I, w I might want to copy some of the same things here that we're doing. So I think I only care about th a few of these things because maybe I want to make a simpler tool. So let's let's do this. Let's um, let's say uh, import click is good. Import no, maybe we'll do the, the the entire we'll do the entire thing. So we have some libraries that were imported, and and so now the AI assistant is going to maybe help me out. So it, it did say something, mute TensorFlow complaints. Sure. Does it does it have some some advice? And, and, it, and it will start to, to try to give you advice. But what I what I really want to do is I want to build, I want to write a function, uh, make a function that extracts text from URL. There we go. So here we go, extract text from URL. And look, it'll actually uh, give me an example of the kind of code that I would like. And now what I can do is I can even run a lint around it. So if I say this, I say make lint, make lint. Um, I'm going to change the lint so that it's asterisk. So this will be any file. Uh, and let's go ahead and try that out. We'll say make lint. And look, it says unused click, unused pipeline. So it's just saying unused imports, which is which is fine for now. Uh, but but I, I like to use the AI tool uh, copilot at the same time as I use um, a linting tool. And so well, what I also like to do is try it out from IPython. So once I build a function, Let's let's try it out, right? So so let's type in IPython right here, and then I'll type in URL and let's yeah let's just use this let's use this URL which is the Python language URL, and then I'm gonna say from um, hfcli import extract uh, URL from <laughs> all that all that uh that output is annoying from hfcli imports uh, extracts from url so now let's put in results or, or text is equal to extract from url put in the url in there and hopefully this works and in fact if i look at it 
there we go it does work right so it was able to grab the entire thing and we can even see the the count of it so we can say len of the uh, text right and we can see that it's got 24,813 characters in it so it's got a lot of a lot of text in there so there we go mission accomplished i'm going to open up another terminal leave this one running so i have i can kind of go back and forth now the next one that i would want to do is why don't we build a function that um, is able to use the transformer to summarize it so, um, so write a function that uses hugging face to return a summary okay process text and you can see here this is this is what's so awesome about uh, copilot is it uh it gives me <laughs> a good example and i don't have to totally trust it yet um you know basically i can actually i can actually um you know like uh essentially test it out by by linting it first and so i would i'd probably lint it lint this first so like make lint and look at the only thing that it's complaining about is wikipedia which is which is not not too bad right that's that's not a bad thing to be to be uh complaining about um all right so we'll we'll go ahead and uh and uh do that and uh we'll we'll, we'll test this one out now so i would just again go back to ipython and i would get out of here like this and then I would uh, open, open, I'll make this a little bit smaller so I have a little bit more room. And then I'm going to run IPython and I can just rerun those same commands again. So I can just say, uh, extract the URL, import that function, but also I want to import process. Let's make the URL, there we go. Let's get the text which should be that. So extract the text. And then finally, um, let's process the text. So we'll say summary is equal to process and then pass in that text. And we can just try it out. Now, it would be nice to, to not have all this garbage uh, be printed out to us. Uh, I, I really don't know why they do that, but Life isn't perfect, I guess. I, I love this. This line is logged at most once for the lifetime of, prog uh, of a process. How about you never show it to me? How about that? That would be great. <laughs> but uh, again, it is doing some free work for us, which is summarizing uh, code or summarizing text. Let's see if it works. summarization process complete so now i just say summary there we go python is a high level general purpose program pro programming language it supports blah, blah blah so pretty pretty cool actually how quickly i was able to build that by by helping with with copilot so now what we're going to do is we're we're to to get kind of similar functionality i'm going to make one more function uh, and this one will write a function. Um, this will be uh, write a function that uses Wikipedia to return a page. There we go. And again, it should be pretty smart here. Let's double check everything. This looks good. This looks good. Let's lint again. I always think it's good to do a, f and let's double check our formatting. Yeah, so formatting will format everything. Lint, yeah, so we'll, we'll say make format. And this should format our code if, uh, whoops. You know like for whatever reason it's not formatted so that's kind of nice right it formats it a little bit although that's that line is a little bit long it's annoying uh but and we'll say make lint like this perfect we have perfect code so far and at this point uh now that i've got all this i, I don't even need to test it I, I i'm pretty sure that's correct I'm going to write a command line tool now. So now I need to say, write a click group, which is the command line tool library. And look, it'll just write it for me. Click group. There we go. Perfect. Uh, now let's write a command that, that uh, let's write 
a subcommand. Uh, so let's change things a little bit. Let's write a subcommand that uh, summarizes a URL. So we we can do this, and we just say but but in this case, see it 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 didn't give me exactly what I want. So I'm going to say uh, URL like this, or URL summarize, or something like that, and then it's going to take in a URL. And then this will actually write the code for me. So this is this is what we want: extract the text from the URL, uh, process it, and then echo it out. Um, that looks good. Now, what's cool as well is that I can actually ask the AI assistant to give me the documentation for my command line tool. So look, we can say this, and even give me an example of how to run it. Look, there we go, hfcli, URL summarize, perfect, right? I, and I have to tweak it a little bit, but but basically it's helping me write this code, which is which is great. And then I'm gonna to write a second subcommand uh, that summarizes the Wikipedia page. Exactly, thank you. I, I love it how it, re it reads my mind. Uh, there we go, that's exactly what I want. Uh, and, and wiki page, perfect. There we go. Summarize the text and look. It even gives us an example because it knew it knew that I was starting to ask for for examples in the documentation. That's it. We got everything we need, and now I just need to invoke it, and we'll just say uh, run it, run the CLI. There we go. Perfect. So it built it. Now I, I'm going to format it. So I'm going to say make format, and I'm going to say make lint. Let's go ahead and uh, lint this out. Great, we got this thing working. So now, in theory, this should just work. If I go HF uh, Hugging Face CLI, let's first look at the help menu. <clears throat> there we go. We have two subcommands. So it's a different command. It's a different tool now. So it says URL summarize, uh, wiki summarize, and so now I can just copy the wiki summarize first. Now this is, I need to give it, uh, the one thing I messed up on is this, I think this has to be in quotes um, or, or it won't work. Uh, so I'm gonna take that command here. Oh. Oh, because it it, uh, it didn't exactly, so you, you have to watch it, it's not perfect, but it's close, close to perfect. And I'll just just uh, copy this again. It, it, it's it's got the right idea. It's a, it's a very smart uh, assistant. Okay. And every every once in a while, I'll get these weird errors, and all kinds of stuff. It's like, okay, sure, I don't know why I'm getting this, but uh, it is giving me weird errors. Okay, so it's gonna run this summarization from the Wikipedia library. And essentially, once this works, there you go, perfect. So you can see how, how easy it is to, to build that out. So now that I've got that working, I think the other one that would be interesting to see if I could figure out would be, could I get Gradio to run and build maybe some kind of a web app locally? Uh, I don't know, I mean, maybe. Um, so if I say get status, let's go ahead and add this. So I'll try really quick to see if I can get a Gradio app to work, um, adding uh, CLI. There we go. So so the we'll, we'll do a get pull here and uh, get push. So so the the Gradio 
is kind of an interesting little twist here. And so I would need to install the right uh, packages for that. Um, and I would probably want to look at, uh, you know, one of these other, I guess this might be done. Is this done? Wow, look at this. It's taking forever. It, it, it may not finish. I'm just going to kill that one. But if I look at this uh, Gradio app here, this is probably close to what I would want. And so I guess let's try to build this, right? Let's let's try it. Let's let's see if I can build this app as well. So I'm going to I'm going to put this into my environments next. So I'm going to say touch app.py and this looks pretty good and then i'm going to um go back to this where is my example spaces um Demo. This is the one I care about. Let's look at the files, and let's look at the requirements. So, so we want these. Gradio. I think I have those two already, but I need Gradio. So let's let's put that one in the requirements. Gradio. Now transformers. I am curious if there's a new one because um, if I do a pip install transformers pip install dash dash upgrade. Let, we maybe we'll get rid of some of those error messages transformers um, so oh I guess it's slightly new so we'll just change it to dot three and then if I do a make install this should install the gradio library and let's see if we can get this thing to to work Okay, so, so now, in theory, if I just run Python app, that would do something kind of similar to the command line tool, but it would run a web application. And look, our code spaces environment is smart enough to, to run it. So we're, I'm going to click on open in browser like this. And Pretty cool, right? I, I can I can actually d write my own uh, uh, text to summarize, um, intertext to summarize, intertext block to summarize. I don't know why there's two. That's weird here. Why there's two of them? Uh, did I screw it up? Let's see here. Model prompts, placeholder. Yeah, anyways, it looks a little bit goofy. I have something wrong with my my code here, but let's try it out. Let's just say, let's grab, um, let's go back here and, uh, or let's go to Wikipedia. That's a good place. I'm gonna go to Wikipedia again. Let's grab some text. I'll go to this and I'm gonna take this. intertext blocks to summarize. So I don't know why there's two of them, but we don't care for now. Now this is running right here, right? We see it's running right here. And we can also get this application. Uh, so we don't need to, to use hugging face as well. Oh, this one, it timed out. Let's try it again. I don't know why it timed out. Let's let's see why is it? Oh, it's it, it may be taking a long time to run locally, and there might be a timeout that's as a result. Um, so I might need to, to to look into how Gradio we can extend the timeout, and, and I can I can see if there's a if there's a way to 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 limit that. Ah, there we go. So look, I did get it to work. Uh, locally as well. So now I have yet another application 
So I have a command line tool and I have a local a web application that I could then customize and tweak a little bit. Now, I guess if I wanted to get a little bit fancy, I could say like, um, you know, like uh, we, we could we could ask our open AI, or, or I'm sorry, our our co-pilot to, to help us build something, which I'm gonna try. So I'm gonna say, you know, um, write a function uh, that uses hugging that uh, um, parses a Wikipedia page and then summarizes it. Okay. So there we go. So so I would have to import Wikipedia. And then um, what I would need to do next is I could I could basically say uh, write a function that uses hugging face to re return a summary. There we go. It looks similar. And writes a function that uses Gradio to return a summary via a web interface. Okay. I don't think that's exactly what I want. <laughs> so, or, or write, write a Gradio or use, or we could say use Gradio to create a web interface that takes a Wikipedia page and summarizes it. Let's try that. Is it smart enough? Let's see if it is smart enough. So it takes process, which is this one, input text outputs. But let's try it out. Maybe it's maybe it's smart enough to do it. Uh, I'm going to to do this. I'm going to comment this one out. And, and then I'll put a little note here that says, okay, let's see that maybe, I mean, that that's a lot less code. I like that. Um, so let's run it again. Now, actually, before I run it, let's, let's lint it. So let's say make lint. There we go. So let's run it. And I, I, I need to get again a, a URL. So I'm gonna take Daisy, Daisy here. And it should launch, perfect, in a browser. Let's see, do we get lucky? It's pretty amazing if, if um, Copilot helped me write this as well uh, because it, I'm shocked actually how good it, <laughs> how, how good Copilot really is. It really is like having an expert sitting next to me and I just ask it questions like, hey, do this, do this, do this. And we can even watch while it's the output, right? Because it, and we could even tell it to, to log more stuff and all, all, the, all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm actually optimistic that it's actually gonna work. Let's see if this actually works. Perfect, woo, this is a pretty amazing. So yeah, got it, got it working. So I'm gonna check this in. So next up here, I wanna talk about OpenAI. And OpenAI is, is similar to Hugging Face in that it, there's pre-trained models that are LLMs or large language models. Uh, but in this case, what I'm gonna do is is talk about first how to explore it a little bit, dive into you know some of the details uh, around it, uh, and then also uh, you know go into uh, potentially you know some solutions that actually we can use to use it, uh, including uh, integrating it with uh, a cloud platform. Uh, I, I think I'll be able to get through all of that. So to start with, we have got OpenAI here. And to use it, you just click on the API, make sure you sign up for an account. There's actually a free uh, tier here that you can use. I already have an account, so I can just log in real quick. And one of the, the, the easiest ways to, to play around with it is to uh, go through here and uh, 
uh, use their like exploration API. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. And in order to get started with it, um, uh, all that we need to do is uh, say, welcome to OpenAI, uh, go through a quick start tutorial, play around with some of the things you can do, content generation, summarization, classification, categorization, sentiment analysis, all kinds of things. I think the examples is probably one of the better places to start with. And what you can do is just play around with some of the things. So just like I did with Hugging Face, I also can do summarization right here. And so it's a little bit different in that it's more of like a sanitized environment. And so I would, you know, if I wanted to summarize this for a second grader, let's go ahead and try that out. The fifth planet from the sun is called Jupiter, right? Now, if I want to go over to what I was doing earlier with um, Daisy, right, we can grab this. And let's actually grab maybe a couple here. And let's go back to our playground and let's put this in. So if I was going to summarize this, Daisy, these, these are two paragraphs. Um, let's go ahead and submit this. Daisy was once aired uh, on September 7th during a commercial break. It was a, an ad created to make people think that if they voted for Barry Goldwater, there'd be a nuclear war. Um, yeah, so this is interesting that it did two different sentences here. Um, so I would, I think it, we don't need that. We probably, although maybe what it did is it is it summarized each paragraph potentially. Um, what, what happens if I make it all one? and clean it up a little bit the text let's try that and uh, let's see see if it, it does a better job now the commercial then cuts to a scene hmm interesting but but basically it's 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 something where i could play around with it and and summarize you know any any bit of text so that's one example um you, you also can use uh, grammar correction English to another language. Uh, let's try this out, right? If, if I want to go through here and, and play around with it, what rooms do you have available? Uh, translate this into one is French, two Spanish, three Japanese. Uh, your, your text ends with a trailing space, which causes worse performance. But there we go. Uh, and if I want to switch, oh, I see one, two, three Japanese. I guess I could do four which would be um, maybe Portuguese. Okay, I'm, I'm always bad at, uh, let me just make sure I, I spell Portuguese correctly. Uh, Portuguese, there we go. I need, I need my spell check for Portuguese. And let's do that. And let's, let's uh, delete this and uh, go through and submit it again. In this case, it didn't do it. One French, two, four Portuguese, submit the output. So, so sometimes you have to, it's a little bit finicky and you have to play around with it. But the, the general idea is there's a lot of things you can do with this. Uh, in fact, explain a piece of Python code to other people. There's also, um, this one is kind of an interesting one I've been I've been playing around with is it's called um, JavaScript to Python. So if I open this up, you can convert JavaScript into Python code, which is which is pretty crazy actually. And this is in private beta. And there we go, right? So it goes through and it and it, and it and it builds this out. Now I don't know why it's building out so many of these, but what I could do is. I thought there was another one here that's like, um, like write Python or something. I, for, I, for, I found it somewhere. You can control which model. Let, let's see if I can find this out. Codex, private beta. And I think they have an example of how to write Python code to classify your content. I'd seen it somewhere. Uh, let, let's go ahead and do Python. They're most capable in Python. Here we go. So this is what I was looking for. Um, end of text. 
Yeah, there, there, there was the codex is the one I was carrying, working with codex. This is what I care about. So saying hello, Python, ask the user for a name and say hello. Yeah, this is exactly what I was looking for. So this is pretty crazy. So if we go through here, you can also just, you can write a doc string and you can, you can have this thing write code for us. And so if we go through here, ask the user for their name and say hello. Okay, let's do it. Let's submit it. Um, what is your name? Print hello, right? And, and then what we could do is I could actually uh, put this into uh, another environment and, and test it out. So let's, um, since I already have the hugging face environment loaded, I'm gonna, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna build a directory uh, no, I won't even build directory. I'll just say like um, uh, open AI example input. So I'll just put that at the, at, as like a, a prompt in front and we can we can just see like examples that it built and I could even put a note here just say like, you know, open AI built this via the codec, codex. And so let's run it. So I go through here and I say Python OpenAI, what's your name? You know, uh, Bob. Hello, Bob. There we go. Perfect. And then I could I could basically kind of go back and forth here, and, and we could say, um, I don't know, uh, write a function that randomly um, randomly picks. Uh, fruit from a list of 10 fruits okay def random fruits print random fruits right and you can see here how if I go back to this we, we can make another one touch open AI example random fruits like that and there we go. Write a function that randomly picks fruit from a list of uh, 10 fruits. And if I go through here and I say Python, open AI example random fruits, no random, pretty easy to fix. I just have to say import random. Write that. There we go. And I, every time I run it, it, it gives me a different random fruit. So you can see that there's a lot of stuff you can do with uh, OpenAI. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna sketch out what I wanna build with this tool. So we, we kinda know it's a very powerful pre-trained model system as well, uses large language models. It can do all kinds of stuff, like including question answer, all, you know, like tons and tons and tons of things. Like, uh, and so, what, I, what I'm gonna do is just sketch out what would be a fun thing to build. And I, I think a fun thing to build would be to, to build like kind of a real world system that's cloud-based. And so let's, let's go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna make this a different uh, background. So I'm gonna build a translation, transcription tool using AWS. So in, in this case, We'll call this a um, a LLM transcription tool. So LLM stands for Large Language Model Transcribe Tool. Transcribe to summarize. Summarize. There we go. LLM, transcribe to summarize. How would this work? Well, first up, I would need to have something that could look at S3 data. Uh, so I would need to write some code that could um, use Amazon to transcribe uh, a video file. And in this case, I have some video files in my S3 account, and I'm gonna go through here and I'm going to um, transcribe them. Next, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call OpenAI and I'm gonna have OpenAI summarize that text, right? Uh, and, and I think that's one of the really powerful things 
that you can do with uh, OpenAI is you can actually hook it up to a cloud-based system and then you've got really the best of both worlds. Now later, if you needed to train the model and to, uh, you know, tweak it a little bit, that, that's that's another thing you could do. So let's go ahead and build this this uh, this end-to-end system. So first up, I'm gonna switch to a different code space. So I have one um, that is a AWS code space, AWS right here. And I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, select this link here and, and, and open this thing up. And, and a couple things I'll, I'll mention about this is that I do have secrets for AWS and also OpenAI set up because I'm gonna use both API keys. And, and what that will do is it'll allow me to, to communicate with a full end-to-end -end pipeline. Okay, so uh, what I can start off with doing here, uh, let's run rebuild the container here because this thing has a little bit of an issue so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through here and do rebuild container and let's rebuild it there we go so sometimes a, a container and that's one of the advantages of using the dev container thing is it'll just rebuild the whole thing from scratch so a couple things that I'll, I'll point out while this thing is rebuilding and you can see all the logs so if I go back to 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 um, to GitHub, this particular environment has, in fact, um, a couple different things here associated with it. One is that if we go to settings and I go down to where it says secrets, notice it has code spaces right here that I have my OpenAI key here that I use. I have my AWS keys as well that are using the principle of least privilege. So they, they just do what I what I need to do for this particular project. And, uh, and and all these keys are available to me so that I can then access them inside of my code. There we go, open AI key. And I even have some YouTube stuff inside of here as well. Uh, and so what's nice about this is this allows me to then um, interface with the cloud interface with with uh, open ai and, and and test all the stuff out so while this is is running let me show you really quick here my aws account so i'm going to go into aws i'm going to log in real quick and uh, we'll take a look at this and So this particular account here, I can go to services, look at all services. <clears throat> and if I scroll down here, we can go to uh, S3 like this. There you go, S3 storage. And with S3 storage, um, if I go down and I, I look at one of these, these, these uh, sections here, I can look at different, um, you know, buckets and and do do different things with them. I think I have one called Transcode Test, and look, I have a, a video file. Look, we can see it's a type MP4 file. It's a pretty big file, it's like so. It's close to a, to a to a gig file. And what I want to do is I want to transcribe this thing uh, automatically, and then I want to use my OpenAI tool to to interface with it. Let's take a look at the other kinds of services that are that are available uh, on aws so they have a, a service called um called transcribe if we go through here and i go to transcribe uh let's go to this here we go amazon transcribe amazon transcribe can create transcription jobs which basically just give you the text uh f you know that i can then later later download and so that's that's really the the goal here, um, is that I've I've I, I want to actually build something that can actually transcribe uh, the the text. And so, fortunately, I've already done that. So I've I have a tool here, and we can walk through what the code does. So what I did was I I with our assistant with OpenAI uh, helping me, I said uh, I want you to build a function 
that can summarize a transcription and also truncate the text to uh, 4,000 characters. And so in this particular example here, uh, I, I have a function that goes through in it and it does that. Next, uh, I want to build a function that transcribes all the files in a bucket. So if I had a bucket full of MP4s, for example, and I wanna convert them to text, I would go through here and I would run this code. This again, I was able to use OpenAI to help me with. And then this one would list the transcription jobs. So once they've been transcribed, do it. And then I have another piece of code that says, give me the URI of the transcription job to download the transcription. And then finally, uh, download it. And then I wanna read it in and return only the text out of it. I don't want any other like JSON payload. And then I wanna write a function that takes that, downloads it, and then returns back the, um, the text. Uh, and, and now if I put all this into a command line tool, I can actually you know, interface with that bucket and, and interface with what's, what, what is gonna happen. So, uh, and then finally I can, I can actually, at the very end here, um, what I can do is I can say, I wanna summarize uh, the, the, the code as well. And so if we go back to summarize here, I think there's a summarize utility right here. This one is, is gonna summarize things using the OpenAI uh, API. So pretty pretty easy tool to, to build when I'm using my AI assistant here, Copilot. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through here and I'm gonna first uh, I'm gonna I'm going to run this tool, which is called uh, Python AWS Transcriber, and let's and let's get this thing cooking. So there we go. Oh no bottle no no module named Boto3, not a problem. I'll just make sure I've got everything installed here. We'll just say make install. Okay, great. And perfect. Now, now if I go through and I run this, AWS Transcriber, we can see I've got all these kind of subcommands. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to list all the jobs that are available. You know, basically MP4s that have been transcoded. So we'll go through here. And let's list all of them. Aha! We and and this look. This is a one-to-one -one match, right? Because we can look at transcode. This is the bucket. These are all the transcribed jobs, right? I see three of them right here. Three three jobs. So if I go through here, look. These are the three jobs that we're able to, to find. Now, I want to actually summarize uh, a transcription job, or I want to get the results. So let, let's get the results first. So we know that that's one of the jobs that I can look at. So we'll go ahead and say Python, uh, you know, AWS transcriber, um, and we we, we want to say get results of, of this particular job. So let's 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 see what the text is, right? Because it took me talking for an hour, and it grabbed all the text out of it. And there you go. It's a lot of text. In fact, I could probably word count it. Like I could do word count dash L and uh, well, dash C maybe characters. Anyway, so yeah, we see it's 21,484 characters. Um, so like pretty, pretty, pretty large amount of text. And now that I've got that, I, I again run my tool that we see that I can actually summarize it. That's it. So all I need to do now is is do this and say summarize uh, the, the 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 tool. So summarize. There we go. Now it's going to go through. It's going to grab all the stuff and look. And now summarized the the results of the of that of that output. So what's what's pretty cool about this is that it, it shows that uh, I can actually use the power of the cloud plus the power of like a pre-trained API, like in the case our LLM model, like OpenAI to actually kind of build these more sophisticated tools here. And so who knows what I would do with this. Maybe I would, you know, put this into captions on videos that I created or or, or whatever. Now the next step would be now that I know I can do that, 
could I build out a tool that's like a question and answer uh, tool that that I would use for OpenAI. So let's go ahead and try that out. Let's see if we can build an OpenAI tool here that does question and answer. So I'm going to say OpenAI um, answer bot, answer bot like this. And I'm going to do this answer bot CLI like that. So I can import it if I need to. Because if you have hyphens, it's kind of, it just makes things messy. So now the, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you know, import uh, OpenAI like that. I'm going to say, um, you know, write, uh, write a function to get uh, an answer from the OpenAI API. Here we go. Here's a question. And, let, and it, it, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. There we go. For, for it to actually give you some prompts. In this case, there we go. Open AI key, right? This uh, is not exactly what I want. So what I can do is I can look at my other, I actually have one already here. So we can say, um, in fact, in my case, I'm, I'm just gonna be lazy and I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy a little bit of what I had earlier uh, because why not help it out? So in this case, this submits a question to the OpenAI API. Now, in this particular example, because I've loaded the API key in my GitHub Code Spaces environment, then I can actually access it and then use it in the rest of my code. And this is really just essentially the sample code that you would get from um, from from the prompt uh, that 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 you would that you would that you would ask, and so this one says this submits a question to the OpenAI API. Now, how would I play with this uh, initially? Uh, I think one of the ways that we could do this is with with IPython. So let's try it. Let's try it out. So if I type in IPython and I say from Open Open AI answer bot CLI import submit a question and we do text is equal to what is a good color for a birthday I don't know some something something like that and then we, we would say um, results or actually let's just let's just print it out right because this this looks pretty good let's just say submit question and we'll put in the text let's try that out oh import os so let's import os so i think i might need to to see this is going to cause a problem i need to to reload this environment so we'll do that and you know, let's try that out so we'll say I python we'll make the text we'll import submit question We'll submit the question. A good color for a birthday is pink. There you go. Pretty pretty cool. Uh, that uh, it's gonna it's gonna. I just have to answer it, ask it questions that it can give me back uh, results now. So now that I know it works, maybe I would do like a lint to just make sure that I don't have any bugs in my code. Yep, everything's still working. So now let's open up Click, and uh, let's import Click. And let's build this into a command line tool, right? So, let's let's go here and let's say um, we'll say build a click group here, and we'll say um, click group. There we go, and we can say uh, even some documentation. We can say uh, an open AI tool to answer a question. To answer questions there we go and then I can build a click see it even tells me a prompt of what it thinks I would want to do but I I can actually just build off of it I can say build a click um, subcommand um, that takes a question so 
I mean, I guess their terminology is correct, but I want to name it something. I want to call this question, question like that. And then we give it the text as an argument. We do a question. There we go. This is the main functionality that you ask the open AI, open AI API question again answer. For example, who won the Summer Olympics, etc. Now let's change this a little bit as well, and let's build out a um, more of like a a clean interface here. And so what we can do is we can say chmod plus x, and we can do open AI here, and we can and we can um, uh, change change this so that it's this open open AI open AI answer bot answer bot cli.py there you go let's and then and we'll add this here like that so let's try this does this work it didn't didn't do anything <laughs> so so submit the answer uh because i don't I haven't invoked it yet because i need to add a um a main function so what we, what we need to do is uh, run the, the CLI, and we just need a main function. Now if I run it, no such command, who won? Oh, because I need to do a subcommand, uh, which would be this. It would be question, like that. So, so what I need to do first is do a help menu. So we'll add a help menu. There we go. An open AI tool to answer questions. And look, here's the commands. Um, I guess it would be it, it would be technically called a command, not a subcommand. So build a command, but I just need to put the, the name of the command in there. And so now, if I just put in text, this should, or question, this should work. Who won the 2020 Summer Olympics? The 2020 Summer Olympics were postponed due to COVID-19. Well, who won the um, 2016 Olympics? Control E. They were held in Rio. The United States won the most medals with 121. <coughs> so we have a, a pretty cool little um, super AI system <laughs> that we built out that we also use the AI to help build AI. And let's go ahead and, and build out a test. Let's say make test. And uh, there is no, t or make lint. We, we have no test so far. We just have linting. Yeah, our code our code is looking good. So we, we could we could do, uh, try to make something a little bit more sophisticated, uh, which which would be kind of fun. So we have the, the submit a question which is nice, but what if we wanted to do something similar to what I did earlier with, um, you know, with uh, hugging face? And how would we do this? Well, I think we can do this. So, what I what I can do is I can say, um, you know, uh, build build a function that uh, reads the text from a, uh, a web page, all right? And so we would probably wanna import beautiful soup, import beautiful, now I should install beautiful soup and I need to look at my other project real quick. So let's just kinda copy some of our code from our other projects and let's let's build this out. So, I think I was using hugging face here. Hugging face CLI with code space is perfect. And uh, we want to look at this and we want to do beautiful soup. So let's add that in. There we go. And in fact, if we want to be lazy, which I think is not bad, we could even kind of look at, I mean, I guess we could we could grab it, 
but let's see if it'll it'll be smart enough to do it on its own. So, um, and, oh, I need to look at the import. Let's, let's look at the, um, yeah, so import BS4. Let's do both. Let's grab those. So now I can do it again. I can say uh, write a function to get the text from a URL. Okay. This function gets the text from a URL. There we go. Response. It looks good. I mean, uh, what is the error handling that was here though? Uh, this is using headers. I like this one a little bit better because it looks a little more sophisticated. So you don't always have to take what the, the AI gave you. You can just build your own. This looks a little bit cleaner. And, and, and now let's lint it and format it. So we'll say make format, looks good. Make lint, make sure that works. Ooh, what, what's, what's wrong here? So unable to, uh, to import, oh, I need to do a make install. There we go, because I need to install Beautiful Soup. There we go. Now I lint, and it works. Okay, perfect. Now the other thing I'll need to do is I need to write an OpenAI function that will summarize. So write in OpenAI function that summarizes text. Okay. Let's see what it gives me. Uh, there we go. There's a prompt. This looks good. This looks good. It looks pretty smart. Um, but what I'm curious about is how does it know? How's, how does it know um, how to summarize though? That that's what's kind of the 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 prompts. Uh, which I, I let's try it out. We'll, we'll, we'll try it out. We'll see if this this can actually do it. And then uh, I'll first try it out with IPython. So first, let's do IPython, uh, and we'll say from this OpenAI. Well, let's let's open up everything first. I imports everything, and we type in who. It shows me everything that's loaded. So first, let's get the text. Uh, will be um let's grab this which would be extract text from or let's do the url first so we'll say url url equals and we can do again uh this there we go and then we can just say um, text is equal to extract text from url url okay so it's got that and if i say len text we can see how big it is it's probably pretty big it's pretty big right it's got 17,646 characters now here's the 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 magic test here does this work we can say um summarize and we can do text Ah, the, the, the model's maximum content rate is this. You requested, please reduce your prompt or completion length. So one of the things that we, we, we may want to do is, um, is we, we want to compress this to, to be less, uh, less text. And so I think I could do this. I could say uh, return a max of, let's do 3,500 characters, because I think that would be about what I would need. Oh, your content text, your token is 2049. Well, okay, let, let, let's try this. Let's just say 3,500, and then there we go. Right, so it kind of helps me out to 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 solve that problem, and for the the this model's maximum content length is this. 
so I believe that could be a problem, which let's just even do 1500. So let's just do 1500. Let's do a max of 1500 characters like that. Okay. And uh, let's go back to, to this and let's try it out again. Text, or let's first import everything. Go to the URL, grab it, extract the URL. And, and now if we, if we say len on the text, it should be smaller, right? It should be 1500, exactly. And we could just even type it out, right? And, and, and now we would just do summarize text. Is it smart enough to just know how to summarize without telling it to summarize? I'm, 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 I'm a little bit pessimistic, but I guess it's smart enough to know that it should summarize. The advertisement was controversial because it, and, and if we look at the results, let's see if, if it was able to, to, to give us anything that we cared about. Results. I think there's a better way to let's let's look at the len of the results. How many? How many? See that doesn't make sense. That's not that's not a great summarization. What I think we need to do is we need to change the prompt to be um, an f string that is the. Um, Oh, I see. So let's let's change this to be um, dollar sign, and I could even ask it to to um, create a TLR prompt, and let's see what it does if it's smart enough to do this. Huh. Summarize. Maybe it, yeah, maybe this is how you do it. I, I actually don't know. So I'm optimistic. Let's try it. So I'm gonna go through here. Uh and we'll we'll do we'll say again from import it. We'll say URL, got this. We'll say um uh text will be extracted, and now we summarize it text what happens does it actually do a summary and let's see how long it is hmm summarize the text the advertisement was controversial well it looks like it uh, it looks like a decent summary actually of um, and if I look at the result, let's see how long the result is. And if we say len uh, results, let's let's try that out. Len result fifteen hundred. Hmm. It's it's funny. It made a bigger summary than the the text I gave it, which. I think we want to do, if I go back to the, um, I mean, I, I guess you have to play around with these prompts here because I thought that there was a TLR didn't, look Look at this one. This one is probably, um, could be interesting prompts. If you add that at the end, notice how it works is you put the text and then you do that. Let's try this, let's try this. This is more what I was I was hoping to accomplish. So if I just change this and I just do this, now let's try one more time. Let's see if this works. And uh, I Python and we make a URL, we do the imports, we do the text, extract it, and then we summarize it. 
This should be much, much shorter. Land result, hopefully like a line. So that is shorter, and we, and we do results. And how much shorter is it? The ad was a nuclear explosion. So interesting. So I don't know if this one, but this one also, we, we have to be aware that I'll do the last change is I can use a more advanced one, which is this. This is the more advanced model. And max tokens, here we go. So let, let's try this one now. Last one, let's see if that changes it. So we'll go through here, go through to the URL, go to the extract, then go through and uh, summarize it. Ooh, that was quick. There we go. That's what I was hoping for. So now we're almost done. Let's build this up. Let's build, now we got a pretty cool tool, actually. I might want to use this myself. Is let's build a, um, uh, it's probably smart enough to know what I want. Build a command line tool that, that takes a URL and summarizes it. That's exactly what I want. Summarize, summarize. There we go. Perfect. That's exactly what I want. And let's try it out. So pretty cool. So let's go ahead and say uh, make lint, make sure the linting works. Always a good, uh, look at this, function already defined. So it found one bug, 84, oh, summarize, uh, summarize uh, URL. How about that? Make lint. So you do wanna, you wanna make sure that you're doing, doing um, linting. So, so now that I've got this, I should be able to, to play with this. There we go. The, the 2020 Summer Olympics were postponed. So they're able to summarize that URL. I, I guess the last thing that I'll do, that's kind of a fun one to play around with. So first, let me push this so people can get access to it. So let's say get status, get add everything, commit this, adding summarizer and um, get commit dash m adding summarizer okay the next thing to do would be to to really quick look at um, old man and the c uh, the text which should be like text I believe is like right here. Perfect. This is exactly what I want. And uh, I'm going to summarize the old man in the sea. <laughs> so let's let's do that. One of my favorite books. Let's go to this, summarize it. And what is the point of the whole book? There we go. The old man was a fisherman who had gone 84 days without catching a fish. He was getting old, his hands were scarred. He finally caught a fish, but it was so big and strong that it pulled him out to sea. The old man fought the fish for days and finally killed it. But when he tried to tow it back to shore, the sharks came and ate the fish, leaving all the skeleton. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's the that's the short that's the Cliff Notes version of uh, Old Man of the Sea. I mean, a little bit of context missing, probably because um, of uh, some other some other things that aren't in here. But uh, but but not bad.